Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 14th meeting in 2019 in the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I make the usual message about our mobile phones, please? Uh, and the first item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's medium-term financial strategy from the Derek Mackay, who is the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Economy and Fair Work. Uh, Mr Mackay is joined by Scottish Government officials Lucy O'Carroll and Daniel Heintz. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement if he wishes. Thank you, convener. Uh, briefly, the MTFS will help this committee and others scrutinise government budget planning by setting out the very real limits to our funding, clearly laying out the consequences of UK choices on Brexit, on austerity and our public finances, as well as providing a clear picture of the impact of the fiscal framework on future Scottish budgets. Alongside the latest economic and fiscal forecasts that set out our framework for the Scottish Government's spending review, as well as the fiscal principles and policies which will guide the use of our borrowing powers and reserve powers. In line with the written agreement between the Scottish Government and this committee, the MTFS sets out the economic and political context for the spending review, the criteria which will govern the assessment of budgets and the process and timetable for review. Irrespective of the UK Government's decisions about its spending review, we do plan to undertake a review of spending in 2019 beyond 2020-21 with a focus on addressing Scotland's long-term challenges, notably climate change and child poverty. I welcome questions from the committee. Thank you for that short opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, the Fiscal Commission have told this committee that as part of the first income tax reconciliation, that next year we can expect a reduction of £229 million in the Scottish budget. They also informed us of further potential reductions in income tax because of reconciliations in future years. If their forecasts prove to be accurate, amounting to £608 million in 2021-22 and £188 million in 2022-23. Now, they said quite pointedly to us that the Scottish Government would have to adjust its spending plans or increase taxes to deal with the forecast reductions. So I think it's fair to ask you, Cabinet Secretary, do you think these figures are accurate? And just how do the Scottish Government intend to manage this, what appears to be a very challenging picture? Uh, convener, can I take the uh, question in three parts uh, in terms of accuracy, how they've arrived at them, and then how we manage reconciliations, which is essentially the question, which of course is uh, absolutely right to, to pose that question. First of all, in terms of accuracy, um, of course we, our budget is driven by the SFC and the OBR numbers, therefore uh, that is what, what drives uh, the budget and the, and the resources that we are uh, dealing with. I've looked very closely at the SFC report, as you would uh, expect, as it informs the MTFS, and also the evidence that they've given to this committee in terms of accuracy and their explanation. So in terms of reconciliation, I think it is important, of course, because some people do confuse the forward forecasts with the uh, reconciliation specifically. But talking specifically about um, reconciliation, it, it does feel perverse that when income tax is rising, when overall the tax take uh, will be up, when GDP is performing in a positive fashion, when we have low unemployment and when earnings growth has been increasing, that we have those negative reconciliation over the three years that you uh, described. It does feel uh, uh, perverse in that regard. But it is absolutely down to relative uh, forecast accuracy. That's what the uh, uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission have explained. They have said that their forecast error was inevitable. And in new information that's appeared over the course of their evidence to committee, in fact, that they're saying the, the, in terms of new information, the average absolute error could be around £500 million a year, positive uh, or negative. So those, those figures are set in that context. Now, in terms of the forecast errors, of course, we're dealing with two different forecasters with two different methodologies and two different sets of assumptions, which then arrive at... Uh, the figures on outturn, and as we have more outturn data, we have the exact figures because these are still forecasts. We'll have more actual. We'll have the outturn data in in July uh, for that first uh, financial year. Um, 
So I would point to the SFC's um, commentary and analysis, which says that reconciliation is not about performance of the UK or the Scottish economies, but about the accuracy of the forecast. So that's what this is about, the accuracy of the forecast then being reconciled on outturn. The explanation for that that's given by the SFC, we follow this analysis, of course, although we've got uh, an increase in income tax forecast for Scotland, uh, it is the case that the block grant adjustment, so the income tax for the rest of the UK, has increased more than in, in Scotland, it making our net position worse uh, than was forecast. Now, of course, at the next fiscal event, we'll get the further updates for uh, forecast. Beneath that shows that there's stronger than expected growth in UK receipts that hadn't been forecast by the OBR, and that explains the divergence in those figures between the OBR and the SFC. What they're not sure about is whether that's a distributional or cyclical issue. So SFC have pointed out that uh, these negative reconciliations may well be followed by positive uh, reconciliations. In page six uh, of the official report, the commentary that I've seen to the committee, it points out to further explain why they believe this has happened. They believe it's the higher concentration of higher rate taxpayers and the recent growth from UK income tax has been concentrated amongst them. It, from my point of view, in other words, that's increased inequality, actually, between higher rate taxpayers and others, so increased inequality in the rest of the uh, UK. Now, of course, as responsible forecasters, uh, the SF, SF, SFC and the OBR uh, will look at the outturn data, will look at that analysis, and that will inform future forecasts with a deeper understanding to the tax composition in Scotland, based not on estimate, uh, but on uh, fact. And in many of those areas, now turning to the, so what do we do about it? That's the explanation from how it's arisen, why the reconciliations as is they are right now. And if I make the assumption that they're right, so I think that's prudent and fiscally responsible for me to do, to assume that they're right, by further amendment to that, then work through the consequences of that. Welsh, recognising that the Fraser of Allender Institute have said that many factors will be out with our control that are materially significant to Scotland's economy, such as uh, issues around uh, oil and gas contributions to uh, the, the economy, migration, uh, other matters, Brexit and other matters. Um, but as we look at the potential reconciliations, the tools that we have to manage that will include what available resources are there at the time. Because bearing in mind, although we have the ability to draw down from the reserve uh, and we have the, the borrowing powers as, as set out in the MTFS, Actually, it will still be the case that the majority of funding comes from the block grant. So the block grant, uh, the Barnet consequentials, is still significant to Scotland's budget. And also UK fiscal policy and UK tax policy as it relates to Scottish tax policy. So that will determine the available resources that we have, which would be one of the determinants. Uh, available, available resource uh, borrowing, up to £300 million and then the use of the reserve to draw down to that to help manage the kind of um, reconciliation uh, in the scale that's been set out. So a range of factors there, block grant, Brexit, austerity, will all impact and now in future resources, the tax policy of the UK government, because that will determine uh, the resources that we have going by the fiscal framework, and then the forward look, and all of that will then set the context for me managing these re um, reconciliations as part of the budget process, which, I, of course, I would explain uh, at uh, budget time. And I don't think it would be right to set out individual scenarios, and I know there's been some criticism of that, but some scenarios about how we could have done that, but I've set out the principles that I would deploy in terms of the use of the borrowing reserve. And you can ask, politics changes from day to day. UK government's tax position is very likely to change for example, leadership contenders for the Tory party will ultimately become Prime Minister, and whatever tax policy they have will be materially significant to the, uh, a, the fiscal framework and the relative position for us in terms of tax. So I'll take a, a prudent, fiscally responsible approach to manage those substantial uh, reconciliations, uh, not helped, of course, by Brexit uncertainty, but that's the explanation around 
forecast accuracy, that's all that this is about, how it's been explained by the SFC, and then what the Scottish Government does to manage that. I agree, quite substantial reconciliation uh, that's required. But reflecting on what you've said, Cabinet Secretary, the two words that the, the, the Fiscal Commission said to us were adjusted spending plans or increased taxes, but you've not reflected on that in your comments. Why, that's because in the much fuller explanation, what they don't know, what I don't know, and what the UK government right now doesn't know is what their budget will look like, whether they will have a spending review, whether they will use the fiscal headroom at £26.6 billion, what their tax policies will be. So bearing in mind that the block grant, the largest determinant to Scotland's budget being the block grant is determined by the UK government, with their financial position in such an, a volatile and uncertain position, those matters uh, are materially significant to the Scottish budget, and that will then set the contact, context for the other things we do. So how much revenue we raise, and this is a point of reconciliation, in terms of tax will be determined by what's the UK tax policy and what's the Scottish tax policy. So yes, we may have to look at spending as well, of course, um, but that will be as well as all the other determinants that set the Scottish budget. So there are too many unknowns in terms of what the UK government might do in their fiscal policy, because that drives so much of Scottish fiscal policy and how we respond to that because of the nature of the fiscal framework. Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Camina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so we, we, have from, we have in front of us a very stark set of forecasts from the <coughs> Fiscal Commission, and we know that there are only forecasts, but you just said, Cabinet Secretary, and I agree with you, that the prudent thing to do is to assume that they're correct. That's what you just said. So the prudent thing to do is to assume for the purposes of our conversation this morning, that these forecasts are correct. The forecast is that you have a £1 billion black hole in your budget. Let me ask the question. That you, you have a £1 billion black hole in your budget, and the Fiscal Commission say that there isn't enough in the Scottish Reserve, there isn't enough in your borrowing powers to, to cope with that. This will mean that the Scottish Government will have to adjust its spending plans or increase taxes. Their words, not ours. And the prudent thing to do is to assume that that is correct. So then we turn to the medium-term financial strategy to discover uh, what your spending plans are to cope with this billion-pound black hole, or indeed what your proposed tax increases might be in a range of um, scenarios. And we find absolutely nothing on either score in the medium-term financial strategy. That homework's been marked by the uh, Fraser Valander Institute, and, and you failed, didn't you, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, no, I think you'll find that I have successfully passed three budgets in a row. I've balanced the books, and I continue to do so in a fiscally responsible way. I've set out the principles that I'll deploy, so to do. The economic indicators for Scotland right now is record low unemployment, outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom at 3.3%. UK unemployment is higher. Record employment in Scotland, record export increases, GDP growth that's been sustained and better than the SFC had previously forecast. Uh, as they say, exports on the rise, outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom, and foreign direct investment second only to London and the southeast of England. Income tax is rising, and earnings growth is on the up in real terms. So I think those are strong uh, economic indicators and strong economic foundations. In terms of the... Well, let, let's turn to those specific questions, but I think it's important to contextualise if I'm, I'm, I'm you know, being accused uh, by the, the Conservatives of economic mismanagement. I think that's somewhat hypocritical at the hypocritical at the moment when you look at the continuation of austerity or Brexit chaos that's impacting uh, on the economy. And as the SFC have stated very clearly, will have a profound impact on the UK and the Scottish economy. But in terms of that billion pound reconciliation, let's stick to the facts. Those are figures driven by the SFC and the OBR. That those figures are reconciliations around forecast error not economic indicators, forecast error. That's said very clearly by the SFC. Does that present a challenge to the government and the parliament? Of course it does. Of course I would prefer that I had a billion pounds, positive reconciliations, but we have to work within the figures that are presented to us. But again, to, to describe it in the pejorative language that Mr uh, Tompkins has is unfair because it just disregards the last 15 minutes of evidence that I've given 
that there is more to the Scottish budget than just those income tax reconciliations. There are the other matters of the uh, financial envelope, the block grant, uh, the other uh, levers uh, that we have uh, around borrowing. It is true to say, I certainly accept the point, uh, that in terms of the reconciliation from income tax year 2018-19, which applies to budget year 2021-22, the forecast reconciliation at £608 million does indeed go beyond any deployment of a drawdown of reserves a, or the, uh, essentially the borrowing a power that we have. So even if you maxed both, it would be true to say that doesn't reach £608 million. But my point, back, point? my point back is that you have to consider all the levers, the totality of Scottish Government resources at the time. We won't know what the block grant it will be a, a, in that uh, budget year 2021-22. And therefore, there's a number of material considerations uh, that would come into play here. So it's not true to say it would be just spending or a, a tax a adjustments, because the main driver of the Scottish budget continues to be the block grant. In terms of the spending plans, I made it very clear in the medium-term financial strategy, I costed po policies last year, but I made it very clear that I'm undertaking a spending review. Now, the UK government has committed to a spending review, but they now seem to be prevaricating on that point. I've written to the Chancellor, to Treasury, asking are they going ahead with a spending review, and I've not had a reply to my letter. I think the letter was dated April. And I know there's a bit of um, uncertainty in the ranks of the UK government at the moment, but they haven't confirmed whether they will determine a spending review. Again, that's important to give us the necessary information for us to conduct a, a spending review. So the reason there aren't costed new policies is because we will be conducting a spending review that does exactly that. We will be conducting a budget process that does exactly that. The MTFS is not meant to be a mini budget. In terms of the Fraser of Allender a, a commentary, of course, I've read it with a great interest. Um, they have welcomed parts of the medium-term financial strategy, such as the principles, uh, such as the approach and spending review, and such as the uh, capital elements where I've given more detail around uh, the borrowing uh, requirements and principles there. If the Fraser of Allender Institute is frustrated that I haven't set out a full-scale spending review or costing more policies, it's for the reasons that I've just given. But what it does is absolutely contextualise the financial challenge that we face and the kind of approach uh, that I'll take to address the challenges that have been raised. But I want to reassure Mr Tompkins that I am, that I am absolutely taking the forecast seriously and that will be the assumptions we are working to. Um, we are some way through the looking glass, aren't we, Cabinet Secretary, if you think that it's all rosy in, in the garden and yet we're facing a £1 billion uh, black hole in these reconciliations. And it's interesting, isn't it, that in your medium-term financial strategy you say nothing about growth below trend, you say nothing about real earnings being lower now than they were a decade ago, you say nothing about productivity lagging behind uh, key, key competitors. And where, you know, wherever you look in the medium-term financial strategy, it's been condemned as not fit for purpose, as you know, failing to meet the, the tests which were, which were set for it in the budget process uh, re review. Whether we look at what you've said about economic risks, whether we look at what you've said about fiscal risks, particularly social security spending, or whether we look at what you've said about spending priorities, what you have said in the medium-term financial strategy has been condemned, not by the Conservative Party, but by the Fraser of Allender uh, Institute. But let's just focus on one element of it, because it's an element that, that um, uh, is focused on in the SFC's comments, which you still haven't responded to uh, adequately, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in comparison with last year's MTFS, this year you say nothing whatever about spending priorities. You say nothing about what areas will be prioritised, and in particular you say nothing about what your strategy will be for non-priority areas. So given that we are looking at the potential of a £1 billion black hole, um, given that you clearly won't want to share with the committee this morning what your future tax policies will be, what are you saying about spending? And in particular, what are you saying about spending in areas that you have identified as non-priority areas to meet the, the billion pound black hole that you're going to have to meet? I disagree with the premise of the question. I believe that throughout the SFC, as, as, as driven by the Budget Process Review Group, the uh, report and the forecast that the SFC has published does have the financial forecasts over the five-year period. It does have a funding trajectory. It does have the determinants 
uh, that are significant here. It does outline the fiscal disputes that we have with the UK government. It has set out the principles for the spending review. The spending review is at the point at which we have the further costed policies, and then we set out what the priorities are uh, within those. Uh, we're also delivering upon a, a manifesto around policy commitments that the government has undertaken. We're working our way through that. In terms of some of the matters that Adam Tomkins raised but didn't want me to address, but I don't think it's fair to raise them, then not allow me to address them. Factually incorrect, uh, real uh, wage earnings is on the increase. Income tax take in Scotland is on the increase. And economic performance is strong all threatened by Brexit. That's what the Fiscal Commission... Mr Tompkins is shaking his head, but that's what... UK but that's, no, I'm by. sorry. Um, Mr Tompkins, where can you point to in the Fiscal Commission report that says what you're saying? Nowhere. What the Fiscal Commission says very clearly in its report, it's the Brexit threat that's impacting and subduing our economic performance. Uh, nothing else. There are key factors no around wage, population, no population and productivity are absolutely areas to focus on, some of which is out with our control. That's what the Fiscal Commission report has said. And maybe complain about what's not in the report. Maybe Mr Tompkins should have read the report and he'd have been better informed for this morning's questions. James. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you've now accepted in your opening answers to the Convener that the position set out in page 46 of the medium-term financial strategy of a £1.025 billion gap between what's been set in budgets and what's uh, forecast in terms of uh, future revenue and block grant adjustments. So the, the scale of the problem is really stark. And what's really surprising is that there's no detail in the document as to how that is going to be dealt with. Um, if you take child poverty as an example, um, in your own constituency, there's a ward, Renfrew, South and Gala Hill, where child poverty is at 35%. That's something that I know will concern you greatly. Um, but it's re really galling that when you look at the document in terms of child poverty, there's a reference to uh, it should reach outcomes, but there's no assessment of the fact that there's a billion pound uh, forecast gap now and there's no assessment as to how that is going to be dealt with going forward to address the unacceptable levels of child poverty, not only in your constituency, but throughout Scotland. Well, convener, the document itself covers the medium-term financial strategy. Last year, it had costed policies. We'll take policies from uh, budget to budget. It will be the case that uh, the uh, community secretary will give a statement on the targets around uh, child poverty in June, so there will be far more detail analysis uh, and debate at that point, specifically on child poverty. MTEFS is not meant to cover as a comprehensive spending review as a mini-budget, that process, but it sets out the medium-term uh, uh, strategy and the latest forecast. So I think we mustn't confuse uh, the child poverty targets, actions uh, and policies with the medium term financial strategy. And I look forward to, as I've said in the principles for the spending review, making child poverty a priority within the government's spending plans uh, going forward. And I do believe we've used the tax and spending regime in a progressive and fair way. In terms of the uh, tax forecast, from, what, from memory, there was only one member of this committee suggesting that I should depart from the SFC forecast. It's just as well I didn't depart from the SFC forecast. From memory, I think it was James Kelly that said I should depart from the SFC forecast, which would have compounded the issue of a billion pounds reconciliation. I've said in answer to yourself, convener, and Mr Tompkins, let's assume that those figures are right for the purpose of having a plan to work our way through the reconciliations with the various tools at our disposal. I think it does speak to the inadequacy, though, and this is a very serious point, convener, around the inadequacy of the fiscal framework in terms of dealing with this scale of reconciliation. If it's true to say that there will be a pattern of negative reconciliation, and if it's true to say, as the Fiscal Commission has done by way of new information, that the absolute <coughs> average of potential error could be around £500 million a year, then I think it does show the inadequacy of the resource borrowing powers and the ability to draw, draw down with all the other complications we have 
and also the welfare powers as well. But no matter what, I will balance the books. I'll give a, a, a fiscally prudent and responsible budget to Parliament that does so uh, every year. And we'll absolutely target the areas of spending that would be right and progressive and tackle child poverty and sustainable economic growth, which I'm sure will uh, reassure uh, Mr Kelly. But contrary to what Mr Kelly has said in the press this morning, these reconciliation numbers are down to forecast error by the forecasters, not government economic policy. In terms of the new budget approach, uh, which we're now all following, the whole point of a medium-term financial strategy uh, was not just to produce the numbers and note them, it was to assess the implications of that going forward. And this document completely fails to do that. It's not fit for purpose. So is it, would it not be better to actually produce a rewrite which would better inform members of the committee and uh, politicians throughout the Scottish Parliament as to the issues that we face. We struggle to take lectures from the Labour Party who haven't produced competent budgets since my time as Finance Secretary when my medium-term financial strategy does set out the principles we'll deploy, does set out the financial scenarios that we're facing, does cover the issues of the determinants that determine the Scottish budget, and the kind of approach that we would take to tackle the reconciliation. Further to the medium-term financial strategy, I'm giving evidence to committee this morning on how I, how I intend to approach these issues, including that reconciliation. So I think there is a lot of detail in the medium-term financial strategy. And whether it's uh, the Labour Party that can't produce competent budgets, or am I meant to follow the prospect of Prime Minister Boris Johnson, whose tax plans don't last five minutes, uh, never mind the enduring nature of our uh, fiscal forecasts and budget approach. Uh, so I do believe it has the necessary information. I'm happy to take questions on it. That's why I'm here this morning. Tom. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I just want to bring you back to a figure you shared earlier on, and this is the fiscal headroom. Can you confirm that is £26.6 billion? That is correct. And this is effectively uh, the UK government's uh, Brexit piggy bank to be smashed open in the event we hurtle over the cliff in a no-deal Brexit. Essentially what that figure is, is that that's a sum that the Chancellor uh, could deploy <coughs> to keep within his uh, fiscal targets and put that into spending. He's chosen to hold it back. He said, first of all, he was holding it back uh, in event of a deal. Uh, and he said he may require it in terms of the Brexit catastrophe. And there's a few areas I agree with the Treasury on, but their warnings around uh, no deal Brexit are catastrophic for the UK and the Scottish economy. So he may deploy it for that. What we have argued uh, in the Scottish Government is end austerity and deploy that resource mm. now. That would mean real new investment um, into the economy. In fact, some would go so far and say if that was deployed, that would end austerity. Mm. It would end austerity if that fiscal headroom was deployed. Instead, it might be used as a, a bandage to Brexit eh, or who knows what any new prime minister might do. They might use it as some form of bribe to the electorate. Mm. Let's say some might want even to use it for tax cuts for the richest in society although Boris Johnson seems to be in reverse gear. But we have proposed that it be deployed to end austerity and invest in our public services and the people of our country. Indeed. Um, I raise it because I've noticed there's been um, some interest in the committee about a potential £1 billion reconciliation. Looking at what a population share for Scotland would be of that £26.6 billion, works out actually about £2.1 billion. What kind of impact would that have what can it un-Scottish budget? What material change could that make for public services and people in Scotland? Well, of course, it's a, it speaks to the point that I made earlier on, that to discount the block grant, because if that was barnetised as part of the, the block mm -hmm. grant, they may be receiving that resource. So it speaks mm -hmm. to the very point that I was making earlier, that the limitations upon us a, are more than just the borrowing power, the drawdown. It is that block grant. And, you know... Mr Arthur can count. You've obviously indicated that if our share was more than the income tax reconciliation it required, then you'd have that extra resource. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of impact it could have. We've had ongoing austerity over the period from the UK government, eh, but if they um, started to deliver that fiscal headroom, then I think it could be positively transformational and undo some of the damage that the UK government has done eh, over the last number of years, not just for the devolved administrations, but around Social Security also. Uh, mm -hmm. where there's been particularly punitive and pernicious attacks on some of the most vulnerable in our society. 
which is why it is perverse to say if that fiscal headroom was to be released. It shouldn't be released yeah. for high-rate taxpayers, but deliver better quality public services, and it would make a substantial difference to the mm. fiscal position in Scotland. As to the exact amount Scotland would receive, that depends on how it's spent, of course, uh -huh. by, by, by departments and then barnetised. Would it be fair to say, rather than sort of hypothetical black holes around potential future reconciliation, is a real black hole in Scotland's budget has been caused by the UK government and austerity holding back this resource? My views on austerity are well recorded, and I'm consistently sparring with the Conservative members of the committee in that regard. Austerity has subdued the economy. That's why the UK has, uh, amongst the lowest um, uh, GDP growth rates, uh, in Europe, it's subdued the economy, it's impacted on services and it's impacted on a society and it's made inequality worse as well. So, of course, I would welcome if that fiscal headroom was released to positively invest in our country and Scotland would get a share of that. Of course, if we get a share of the Northern Ireland bung as well, mm. that would suit Scotland to the tune of £3.3 .3 billion. You see how those multi-billion pound figures are stacking up, the fiscal mm -hmm. headroom, the... Uh, contribution that Northern Ireland got, Scotland didn't. These are substantial figures. It's not tens of millions. This is billions of pounds that Scotland's lost out on. Yeah, that oh, adds up to almost half the NHS budget. It's Sorry, already... last question. Thank you, convener. The final question I just want to ask is um, regarding the uh, fiscal framework. Um, one of the sort of perhaps key drivers for differences um, in performance regarding higher earners um, the Scottish economy and, and, and the UK economy, and perhaps more generally, is difference in population growth. And ultimately, we are going to be at the mercy, not just of population growth, but in growth in working age population. Do you think it's fair that that can have such a, an impact upon the money made available to Scotland via the fiscal framework when we don't have any powers over immigration to combat the Tories' hostile environment, which can put so many people off wanting to come and work in this country? In terms of the fiscal framework's report specifically, when asked about uh, <coughs> comparison to OBR UK forecasts, um, the SFCM report... Um, uh, Speaking from the, the report, page 43, we're forecasting a weaker economic outlook for Scotland compared to the OBR's forecast for UK. This is primarily because of slower growth in population and productivity in Scotland than the UK. Of course, we don't control population. We would like to. We would like to have more powers around migration because it is having an impact. When you look at the uh, structure of the economy and the structure of the population, a shrinking working age population and those paying those taxes, of course, there's a disproportionate effect in Scotland. So it's materially significant to... Uh, the Scottish Government's budget. It is impacting our tax revenues, and therefore I do think it's a structural issue. Of course, for the fiscal framework, we said we would revisit the fiscal framework after one full Parliament's worth of evidence and uh, operation. But I think if you look at the <coughs> levels of reconciliation, some of the factors that's out with our control, and some of that new information in terms of average forecast error, uh, and also what might be a structural issue in terms of high rate taxpayers mm. and deepening inequality in the rest mm. of the UK, deepening inequality, then I think that might be something we might want to consider earlier, as well as the other concerns I've raised around VAT and ADT, because it's all adding the complexity and the volatility to a situation that I think all members are equally concerned about. Thank you. Now, um, you raised the fiscal framework yourself, the Cabinet Secretary. I know that Patrick was interested in that, but Angela, was yours a supplementary to that, or was it a separate point? Um, I've got two questions, one in Brexit, one in child poverty. Um, okay, well, I think in that case, we'll go to Patrick. That's fine. Thank you. Good morning. Um, first of all, just to follow on a little bit and then link it into the, the, the longer term issues about the, the fiscal framework. Um, notwithstanding the fact that we don't know what the, the UK government is going to do, we do know that there's a real chance that the next couple of budgets uh, are going to have to absorb a substantial impact from the result of a reconciliation. And I share some of the criticisms that have been made about the, 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 the medium-term strategy, which sets out analysis of why we are where we are, but doesn't really say what we're going to do about it. And that, it seems, is what a strategy ought to be. But there's also going to be a political strategy uh, associated with this, because you're still a minority government. Uh, in the, the run-up to those two potentially very challenging budgets. So if you're in a position of um, you know, trying to figure out how to do stuff that you wouldn't want to do and that none of us would want to do as a result of very challenging circumstances, how are you going to achieve, how are you going to set out a, a government approach to achieving wider buy-in 
for how to respond to those challenges, not just from within the political spectrum, but beyond. Because if this is just a, a matter of, of you know, opposition politicians shouting, you failed your homework, and you shouting, I'll take no lessons from you, we're not going to get anywhere. How are you going to achieve a wider buy-in to the potentially very challenging decisions uh, that you may find yourself forced to propose to Parliament? I think Patrick Harvey raises a very fair question, and in fairness, it's not just for the Finance Secretary. I am one of 129 MSPs. I think all MSPs will have to behave responsibly and carefully consider what our collective priorities are going forward. How do I uh, propose to, to make headway? Well, one of the areas I've touched upon is uh, the spending review. And if we set out what our policy priorities are, and I've mentioned two, child poverty and climate change as examples, then... We, we find where the collective priorities are in Parliament so that the parliamentary arithmetic will allow a budget to pass in very challenging circumstances. Again, it's, I don't think it's fair, though, to say, as Patrick Harvey did, let's discount the block grant because it's the largest component of the Scottish budget and it will continue to be the largest component of the Scottish budget. So I don't think we can just say, like, discount that and then give us scenario planning on everything else. So I think this scenario planning, we have outlined a range of scenarios from an upper... Uh, assumption, lower assumption, in terms of the overall financial envelope that we think we'll be working within, levels of probability uh, around that. But fundamentally, all those other factors are materially significant to the budget that we'll set. I'll take an inclusive and engaging approach on the budget, as I've always tried to do. I think if we can agree on priorities, then even though it will be challenging reconciliations <coughs> for the reason we've discussed this morning, they're not the only fiscal factors that determine the budget or the overall financial uh, envelope. But I do think that the Parliament has to mature as well in recognising, I agree with Patrick Harvey, it's not just throwing about who's responsible for the Fiscal Commission forecast, because actually they are. They're responsible for forecast error. We as a Parliament are responsible for passing a budget, and I'm responsible for the Government's finances in proposing that budget. I've delivered balanced budgets and intended, uh, intend to, do, to continue to do so. And when we approach the budget, that will set out our spending priorities, and that will send out uh, how we propose to, to tackle the reconciliations uh, in each year. But I do think it will draw attention for all of us to look at further fiscal discipline and making sure that we're getting value for money and that we're also using the uh, borrowing powers and the drawdown in a responsible way. Just, just briefly, you, you, you did also <coughs> mention the, the spending review. You, you are fully committed to that spending review taking place, regardless of whether the UK government does one? If well, It depends how much information the UK government gives us. If they give us absolutely nothing, then I think it would be very difficult to set out a comprehensive spending review for the Scottish government that would be credible. It would be more illustrative than a credible... Ir irrespective spending. of the but UK government's decision about its spending review, the Scottish government plans to hold a multi-year review of spending. That's, that's the, the, the report does go on to say, though, that it will be determined by the information that the UK government okay. makes available. What I would intend to do in any event because I think the right thing to do is to focus on spending commitments, to focus on our priorities and to focus upon things like cross-departmental expenditure, focus on outcomes, focus on well-being. So I'd want to do all of that in any event, um, and we might be able to set out multi-year spending on capital. So it's my intention to do a spending review, but I'm sure all members understand it's easier to do if the UK government is also conducting the equivalent spending review because it influences so many of our numbers. Just, just moving on then to the, the longer term future of the fiscal framework, because there's, there's a review of that due in the, in the coming years. Uh, and I think if, if I understand the process for that right, uh, the, the work on a, a report to advise both governments is probably going to have to begin or, or at least be framed in the next year, uh, if that work is going to be delivered uh, after the 2021 election. Um, it seems to me that the fiscal framework that was arrived at between the two governments, and some of us expressed concerns about it at the time when it was being uh, presented, um, it's given Scotland the position of having partial fiscal autonomy for double the uncertainty, of having uncertainty coming not from one set of, uh, of fiscal forecasts, uh, but from two, as you said earlier, by two different methodologies, by two different organisations. You know, any any normal government would have some uncertainty from its 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 set of forecasts, uh, but it would be able to manage that with greater fiscal autonomy. We seem to have half the 
uh, autonomy for double the risk. Uh, did, is that something that was got wrong with the fiscal framework? Uh, and is that something that needs to be addressed in the way that it's reviewed? Well, I have a lot of sympathy with that uh, analysis, especially as the person responsible for making it work. As it happens, yesterday I had a meeting with the OECD uh, who are conducting the review of the functions of the Fiscal Commission. They'll produce uh, that, that report, I'm sure, but that'll be made available. Um, I mean, frankly, I think that independence has to be easier than the fiscal framework in terms of how to run a country's finances. It also gives us more levers and powers to be able to deliver a more successful nation. But, of course, this was the political agreement of its time. And it is complex. There is volatility. There is uncertainty. I think there's a lot of unforeseen consequences. I don't think it was predicted uh, that um, there would have been the Brexit outcome, which is impacting. But in terms of some of the procedural and technical issues, again, new information. So if you look at the resource borrowing power, it capped at £300 million with an overall borrowing limit. Good reasons for having uh, uh, parameters and that capacity. But if the average potential forecast error is £500 million a year, it, it clearly shows how the current parameters the fiscal framework, I think, are increasingly inadequate as new information and as delivery of the Smith Agreement unfolds. If you then add, add into that uncertainty my concerns around VAT, the legal issues around air departure tax as well, it shows, I think, we need a, a really engaged UK government to be able to make the necessary corrections to this. So we are trying to abide with the agreement around the fiscal framework review, how it's set out, the timescales for it. I think it's clearly proving to be quite challenging. There has been some accommodation, to be fair to Treasury. Remember, the baseline issue was a baseline issue around the um, starting position for income tax. And that was a very technical issue, but I think there are some key, pr key principles that have been challenged as the fiscal framework operates, so I have a great deal of sympathy with what Mr Harvey is saying. It is something I intend to raise further uh, with the Treasury, because I think we are dealing with a very volatile and uncertain um, level of risk. Fair guess that one of the, the one of the losing Tory leadership contenders will end up as the next Chancellor. Do any of them strike you as people who are up for this discussion in a constructive spirit? I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'd love you to answer that, Cabinet Secretary, but I, I want to move on. So fair enough. I, 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 he's made his point. More, more than fair enough. Angela. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, obviously, how the government takes forward its commitment to tackle child poverty is something I'll be following very closely, uh, like other members, as you'd expect. Now, Cabinet Secretary, while I will be amongst those folk who will complain very loudly about the limitations uh, of devolution and the fiscal framework uh, and all that, uh, in short, being a bit of a dog's dinner, I don't know of any country in the world that has any uh, arrangement that's remotely comparable. But the bottom line is, um, as a parliament, we signed up uh, to uh, end child poverty. We introduced uh, statutory targets uh, with very challenging uh, interim uh, targets. But I know that by 2023-24, total public spending uh, will be £183 billion less than it would have been if it had remained on a par uh, with 210 11. So the scale of the challenge and where we start from uh, is, is, is uh, actually a challenge that we all share. So what I would be interested to know is how we will have a discussion about our priorities, what we can do, what we can't do. But also in terms of how we use the powers we have to maximum effect, uh, and also how we have a, a, a grown-up discussion about what levers we could use better and what additional levers we need so that, as a minimum, we have a more coherent package of powers that will make our life a little bit easier and tackling child poverty. It's a, a good question, Convener. I just want to make sure I, I heard correctly in terms of the, the figure in terms of austerity from the UK government when you make that comparison as we traditionally do between investment levels at 2010-11 and to 2023-24 um, which is the period of the um, forecast it's forecast it would have £18.3 billion pounds, uh, less than if spending had remained at those 2010-11 levels so that, that is the austerity figure of uh, 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 the reductions 
In terms of um, ongoing austerity, it's not just the resources that the Scottish Government has available at our resources. I think we should bear in mind the wider impacts on people in Scotland, because that's materially significant. So the benefits freeze, the two-child cap has had an impact as well, and the cash freeze and working age benefits is continuing. These are UK policies that are absolutely impacting on child poverty and poverty generally. In terms of what we can do about it, so I, I've covered in uh, the MTFS the financial disputes that I have with the UK government that could address extra resource in that regard. But in terms of what we can do about it, I think really focusing on the national performance framework, which is about outcomes, not just the inputs, and align and calibrate all our efforts around that sense of, of well-being and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve as a country. Of course, people will then say, well, what you spend in those areas is important and, and, and judge people by their spending commitments. So the spending review itself will also set out the, uh, the areas where we want to focus on outcomes, and that will include uh, very expressively and explicitly child poverty as one of the focuses. So as I engage with Cabinet colleagues on the spending review, I will be asking the Commission what are we contributing towards sustainable economic growth, of course, but also child poverty specifically. And when we look at the social security powers that we have as well, as we can see over the forecast period, of course, it reaches its peak at £3.5 billion, with further volatility as well. But if we say we'll have a system based on dignity and respect, and in some regards, in many regards, we'll have more generous payments and equivalent payments for the rest of the UK government, then we will absolutely be investing in that. Specifically in relation to child poverty targets, uh, the Community Secretary will be making, uh, I think it's a statement of Parliament, but certainly a report that looks at the targets around child poverty, the assessment of and what we're going to do further to address that. And of course, we'll look at the affordability and the deliverability eh, of social security policies as well. So we'll look at all policies in the round to address child poverty, recognise that some are financial, eh, some are non-financial, but it will, be very, it will be foremost in our mind as we look at future budgets and the overall spending review, if that's of assistance. OK, I'm glad the uh, Finance Secretary corrected my figures. Um, moving on to Brexit on a, a, a similar theme, um, in terms of um, powers and options and uh, limitations. So we know that the uh, Fiscal Commission have based their work on um, an orderly Brexit, whatever that is. Um, and they also said in evidence last week that the probability of an orderly exit has reduced, but the probability of a no deal Brexit has increased. So from your perspective, Cabinet Secretary, what happens and what's the impact on your work um, if we crash out without a deal? You know, what are you doing? What can you do? And actually, what could you do? And what thought you have given to where your priorities are? Would you know increasing borrowing powers help? I know there's been some um, discussion and thought from the uh, SFT around other models. Um, of uh, finance in terms of the uh, mutual investment uh, model that uh, the, the, the Welsh do. And you must have um, in your head, you know, some of the priorities over where increasing powers would help. Convener, Brexit is certainly a, a deep concern, I think, for us all. I, any form of Brexit damages the economy. It leads to lower economic growth, lower GDP, uh, lower uh, earnings, higher unemployment. It will lead to all of those things. The SFC uh, report uh, describes it as an orderly Brexit, i.e. some form of deal and transition arrangements, which is why the forecasts are so subdued. It's true to say if there was no Brexit at all, the financial forecast would have been far more positive, and in turn, that would have been good for our revenues, our economic health, and achieving our outcomes. So if we have a deal Brexit, not that you know the Prime Minister tried and failed, now she's lost her job because she couldn't get that orderly Brexit through the Westminster Parliament. So it seems little prospect that that orderly Brexit will be delivered. Um, it's politically pertinent to say, well, unless there's a change of leadership with a change of heart in many of them, but it doesn't look as if any Tory contender will deliver where Theresa May has failed. But who knows? Who knows? Uh, if there is a, some form of alternative deal, then we would need to analyse that. There's a prospect of a no-deal Brexit that's economically catastrophic. That's unemployment soaring, 
from its record low at the moment at 3.3 per cent, record low unemployment, uh, to up to 100,000 people made unemployed, business failure, lower exports, GDP and co collapsing, and the economy going into recession. That, that would have a significant impact. So that's economic analysis of a no-deal Brexit. All of that has been factored into the Scottish Government's resilience thinking. What am I doing about it specifically? Well, as well as preparing as best we can. So for finance and the economy, we have contingency plans for the public sector. We've been working across uh, the public and the private sector to produce those contingency plans. We've made resources available. We are looking at an economic response in the event of a no-deal Brexit because it is so economically catastrophic, working with the banks as well. Access to finance it would be an issue. And we're looking at business support specifically to try and mitigate the impacts. But in truth, no Scottish Government, no Scottish Parliament can totally mitigate the impact of a no-deal Brexit, which feels more likely according to the SFC as well. If the, fi the final point can be, because I know I'm testing your patience with time here, um, but these are serious questions that members are asking. But finally, if there was to be a change in fiscal policy by the UK government, either they can unlock the fiscal headroom, the £26.6 billion to invest in public services, or they can use it to put out the firefight, the, the fire that will be set if we have a uh, no-deal Brexit. So it'll be up to UK Government how they use those resources, and we will have to reset the Scottish budget in that regard. Right. Okay, thank you. Alex. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Just coming back to the Fraser Allender report, yeah, which they you know, summarised in its title of you know, Where is the Strategy? Uh, but yeah, Specifically, they said, yeah, what is striking was the lack of analytical assessment about the economic outlook, the key risks and opportunities we know that are coming from demographic change, automation and climate change, and how this might impact upon the public finances. So yeah, does the Cabinet Secretary think this is an accurate assessment on his lack of assessment? No, I've said that I understand <coughs> the Fraser of Allender Institute's frustration in not presenting either a full-scale spending review or a mini-budget. But this was not intended to be a full-scale spending review or a mini-budget. It sets the financial parameters, it sets out the forecasts, it sets out the projections. There will be a further round of forecasts that will determine the next big fiscal event, that is the Scottish budget. Um, there will be a UK budget before that. There might even be two if there's an emergency budget. We're in uncertain times, and I haven't set out illustrative scenario plannings that would be um, just speculating on a range of possibilities. I've set out the conditions. I've set out the principles that I propose to deploy, the figures within which I'm working, and I would absolutely um, defend the document that I've produced and the evidence I'm giving today to show that we're absolutely focused on the financial challenge uh, that we face. Uh, yeah, that may be, but you know, there's still a lack of assessment around uh, some of the numbers around population and the demographics, uh, which I touched on with the Fiscal Commission last week. Uh, and, you know, the question I put to them was, you know, population is obviously a combination of birth rates, mortality rates, people leaving and inward migration, uh, but net UK inward migration numbers remain steady. You know, so does the Cabinet Secretary think that you know, even if we did stay in the EU single market, that would completely close the growth gap uh, between the UK and Scotland? But Mr Burnett, I think you're asking very good questions, but part of the challenge here is we don't control migration. We don't have a policy that can determine how many people can come to Scotland. Working age population, the composition of the tax base is important. The composition of numbers of people who are in that working age population shrinking is the biggest issue for Scotland's economy in terms of tax take. So we can do so much around economic performance, we can do so much around attracting people to Scotland, but we don't control migration. The projections are that the population in Scotland can only grow through positive inward migration. Who is it that wants a hostile environment to migration to Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom? It's the UK government that want a hostile environment so that migrants don't come to Scotland and to the UK to contribute financially. So the cause of the problem here is not the Scottish Government, it's the UK Government's migration policies, hostile, quite mean-spirited policies that deters people from coming to the UK. We will only have economic growth if we have a growing population and a growing working age population, and we need to do it through migration. I'm sure Mr Burnett is well aware that the biological route will take more than a year or two for working age population profile.
I think that this is a uh, th thank him for saying that I ask good questions, but I think this is the point, but a fundamental point of disagreement is that migration is not the so whole solution here, uh, and that even if we were remaining part of the EU single market, that would not be the final, so for, for, the full solution. And whilst migration might be part of the solution that the cabinet secretary is uh, proposing, you know, the real issue here is that we are not uh, creating the right skills base uh, in, in Scotland. We are not training our young people. Uh, to, yeah, as, as we should be, yeah. And, and, if, and if we rely purely on migration uh, and have more population here, we are not going to be improving our productivity figures yeah. uh, and, and other impacts. And, and this was borne out with the evidence taken from the Scottish Fiscal Commission last week. Well, it's not. That characterisation bears no relation to the evidence that I have read in the Fiscal <coughs> Commission's report. I actually read a quote from the Fiscal Commission's report that spoke about population being the main driver in terms of the... Uh, GDP forecast actually per head of population were reaching convergence uh, with the rest of the United Kingdom. So on a per head basis, Scotland does well on GDP growth. In some quarters, we've been outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. On unemployment, we're outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. On exports, we're outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. On foreign direct investment, we're second only to London and the southeast of England. But on migration, an area we do not control it is the UK government that is discouraging people people to come and work in the UK and uh, by association uh, in Scotland. And there is that kind of magnetic appeal as well to migration going to London in the southeast of England. We do have to work harder uh, in Scotland. We, that's why we wanted a, a migration approach that was suited to Scotland's economic needs. Who's refused that? The UK uh, government. So in terms of productivity, we've had more progress over productivity over the course of uh, devolution, faster than the rest of the United Kingdom. And on wage earnings, we're also uh, picking up growth as well. So to dismiss migration, to dismiss population, totally dismisses the evidence from the independent forecasters that Mr Burnett has, has asked me to look to to be informed. And in terms of skills base, I point to um, the economic action plan and the skills plan that we have. We've brought down youth unemployment we're enhancing the skills agenda. We're doing more around productivity through the National Manufacturing Institute. And we're investing in education uh, so that we have more graduate apprenticeships as well. And more young people are going into positive destinations. So I'm afraid that characterisation is just a total distortion of the facts, even though the fundamental question is right, which is to look at population uh, as a factor in Scotland's economy. OK. Yeah, Pro Professor Smith said last week, you know, he spoke about the worry about the skills of native Scots. Yeah, does the Cabinet Secretary share No, he share didn't that? actually share, say share that. We... No, he didn't say that. Well, you want to read the quote properly, and I'll read what I've got from the official report. Uh, obviously, that is not to say that we do not need to worry about the skills ah. of native Scots. Of course we do. Yes. Yeah. So, so does, does he, the Cabinet he, Secretary he... share Professor Smith's concern over the skills? So what he said is, of course, we need to focus on the skills of uh, Scots. I accept that point. That's why we're investing in the list of measures that I have just listed. But the SFC report, because it relates to the overall economic drivers and it relates to the financial forecast and it relates to GDP, is down to population. That's the difference in the forecast. Simple as that. It's the difference in population and productivity. We're investing in productivity. Population we do not control. Are we investing in the education system, in the skill system, in the apprenticeship system? Are we delivering jobs? Because that's the crucial issue. We can educate people, but are we delivering jobs? Are we creating the jobs? Well, at record low unemployment at 3.3%, it looks as if we are. By some definitions, that's full employment. And we've got record high employment right now. And the only divergence is coming because the number of higher rate taxpayers in the rest of the United Kingdom, the inequality is deepening because the wage increase is higher for those taxpayers than for others. That's a point of divergence which speaks to an issue around inequality. Eh? And I think that's something worthy of consideration. Thank you. Okay. Emma. Thank you, Convener. <coughs> Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'm interested in issues around the complexity and potential conflict resolution. In one of the papers that we have, it says that the fiscal framework sets out provisions <coughs> for a memorandum of understanding between a multi multiplicity of agencies, OBR, SFC, DWP, HMRC, etc., to support effective operation of the framework. So for me, this would appear to be 
what contributes to the complexity of the, the fiscal framework. And we know it causes different uh, figures to be projected based on forecasts, based on estimates. So the complexity, um, I'm sure it probably causes conflict. So if it does, how do you resolve them? And uh, what could be done to make the framework less complex? Everybody says it's the first thing out their mouth is it's complex. Well, it certainly is complex, and uh, the meeting I had with the OECD yesterday, they'll produce their own report, so I don't want to put words into their mouth. You can scrutinise their report once it's published, but I think it's fair to say, and it goes back to the point I think uh, Angela Constance or Patrick Harvey was making, that it's about as complex as it gets by way of a system of devolved finance, and the, even the OECD, I don't think I've seen anything that's quite as complex as this, um, but there we have it. It's a political agreement, there's the technical agreements. I think good relationships is important, so when it's come to HMRC, you've taken evidence, we've engaged with HMRC through a service level agreement, so in the technical areas we try and get as much a pragmatic um, resolution as possible, but this is a political agreement on what powers would be coming to the Scottish Parliament, uh, and then the technical issues between officials on how it operates between a Treasury and the Scottish Government. So we are doing our best to make this political deal uh, work. I think I've said throughout the course of the morning that as we look at these figures and the concerns that members would rightly have around the scale of reconciliation and the prospect of that continuing over a cycle of, of a few years, I increasingly feel, when you look at all the issues together, that the current parameters are inadequate, that the current uh, agreement needs revisited. The timescale that's set out for that is the end of the Parliament by agreement with the UK and the, the Scottish Government, um, with the details yet to be arranged, which would go through the Joint Exchequer Committee in any event anyway. But I do think we'll need an earlier review. I think the Treasury will need to engage with us earlier because of the complexity that's emerging, only because of how we're finding it uh, develop and how we're dealing with it issue by issue, that clearly that complexity is, is, is uh, uh, given us much food for thought. And the Joint Exchequer Committee governs the implementation and the oper operation and review of the fiscal framework. So does that process need to be um, engaged with in a more regular basis or, or to support a further review? The last meeting uh, with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, Liz Truss, I don't know who will be the Chief Secretary of the Treasury once there's a new Prime Minister, potentially a new Chancellor, new Ministers, I don't know. But the discussion that I've had with the uh, current Chief uh, 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 Secretary to the Treasury, is uh, that she was looking at reviewing the Joint Exchequer Committee as part of the whole intergovernmental relations. So there was a prospect of, of a review of the Joint Exchequer Committee, but that was a commitment from the current Chief Secretary to the Treasury last time I met her, um, and next time I meet her then we'll raise it further. Okay, thank you. Well um, thank you, Convener. Um, just a couple of questions, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the document you published uh, two weeks ago, the um, Scotland's Fiscal Outlook, that we're discussing this morning, uh, Scot Scottish Government's medium-term financial strategy. In your foreword to this, the fourth paragraph, the uh, final sentence, you say this. In Scotland, we have used the limited powers at our disposal to protect key services, despite the £2 billion real-term reduction to our block grant since 2010. Is the latter part of that sentence true? Yes. It's not true, is it? It is true. According to um, Spice and the Fraser of Allender, it's not true. There's not been a £2 billion real terms cut in our block grant since 2010. Our block grant has increased in real terms since 2010. As I, you well know, why are you publishing a document with an untruth in it? It is true, and this is the periodical debate that Murdo Fraser and I have around if the levels of investment have been sustained at 2010 uh, 11 levels. Uh, then we wouldn't have lost out in the resources that we've lost out on. It's true to say over the period of austerity, the UK government has um, uh, failed Scotland, failed the whole, whole of the UK through that ongoing austerity. This is but the this, issue this, we have this statement, this, statement, this statement is untrue. I mean, no, you, you have, you've made the point in the past, you know, I might disagree with your figures, you made the point in the past that it is your uh, limited resource budget that has been reduced. But you say here the block grant has been reduced. The overall block grant is up. Spice will confirm that, and Fraser Allender will confirm that. Will you take this document away and correct it, because you're misleading Parliament? This is untrue, 
On the contrary, I'm happy to give Murdo Fraser more information on how the resource fiscal deal has been reduced in real terms. But this, with respect, of this, respect yeah. this does not refer to resource well, fiscal deal. This refers to the block yeah. grant. If you'd said the fiscal resource deal had been reduced, you might have a point. You're not making that point. You're saying the block grant has been reduced. Can the statement in this document is untrue. So can I just ask, because I think this is the first admission ever, just since we're on this very important subject, that Murdo Fraser has just admitted that the total fiscal resource You're deal has indeed been reduced. No, if you check the official report, you will see I, no, I think qualified you have, my comment. I, I think you but, have but, just but conceded that point, point Mr there's Fraser, which is the point that I'm making. Now, and it should be one person speaking at a time, please. One person asking a question, the other answering the question. So we can get back to that format. Otherwise, I'm going to move to Willie okay. Coffee and we're going to end this particular bit of the session. Okay, thank you. Well, I think I made my point, Convener. There's an untrue statement in this document, Department. Yep. And I think you need to be more careful. <laughs> Let me move on. I have, one, I have a, one, a follow-up question to the questions asked by Tom Arthur uh, uh, around um, uh, uh, the, whole, the whole issue of Scottish, Scottish budget. Can you remind us uh, what is under the Barnett formula, the total value of the annual fiscal transfer to Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom? Well, I'm happy if you want to go into those details to turn to officials. I've been taking questions all morning, but if you want to go into specific details, then I'll ask um, officials to, to cover that. I, I don't have that specific number to hand, I'm afraid, um, but I'm very happy to, to okay. supply that. I think, I think if, you, if you check the, the, the annual uh, uh, GERS figures published by the Scottish Government, uh, that figure is, from memory, in excess of £10 billion pounds a year. That is the fiscal transfer to the uh, Scottish budget from the rest of the United Kingdom. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary will recognise that figure. Uh, does the member, does Muddle Fraser want to get to the question? I was simply wondering if you knew what your JERS figure said. So if we're debating JERS, I'm more than happy to do that, but it is something of a sideways step from the medium-term financial strategy. JERS represents the notional estimates of what is raised and what is spent in Scotland. Um, it's true to say that just as the same as the rest of the UK, there has been a notional deficit. Um, through the Growth Commission that I was a member of, and Mr uh, Fraser's well aware of it, we show how we can address that notional deficit, how we can make different policy choices, how we can grow our economy to reduce that notional deficit. And in the most recent publication of GERS, that notional deficit was down. There are many years that uh, Scotland would have been a better financial position relative to the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, and there are years where that will not be the case. If we were an independent country, we wouldn't be dealing with the Brexit madness, we wouldn't have had austerity, and we wouldn't have had a subdued economic performance. We'd be performing like most small advanced economies around the globe, and that'd be growing our economy. So that's the conclusion I take from GERS. It's a current constitutional position that's given us that estimated notional fiscal deficit. I have just one more question, Convener, if I have. Um, you said earlier in the session, just as you mentioned Brexit, that you regretted the failure of the Prime Minister to get her orderly Brexit deal through the House of Commons. Do you now regret that SNP members in the House of Commons voted down that orderly Brexit deal? No, I'm happy to correct the record if that is what I said. I regret the failure of the Prime Minister, full stop. Um, the Prime Minister has been a failure and she's fallen on her own sword. She couldn't even do that right. In terms of uh, delivering... Brexit, it would be better if she delivered the result uh, of uh, Scotland, which of course was to remain within the European Union. The point I was making is, looking at all the economic analysis, a no-deal Brexit is economically catastrophic. If there had been a deal, we've analysed the economic impact, and that would be growth foregoing. There's an impact on Scotland's economy. The best economic social uh, outcome for Scotland and for the rest of the United Kingdom is to remain within uh, the uh, European Union. I think it's just true to say, though, that no replacement Prime Minister looks as if they're going right. to do any better for the United Kingdom right. or Scotland, right. and no new Chancellor is going to give us coherent tax policies going, going from what right. I've seen I'm from Boris Johnson. Right. Thanks very much, Convener. Derek, uh, this might be helpful in leading us into our next roundtable discussion, but there's a, 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 a section in the report that talks about EU funding programmes and it says there that they're worth about £5 billion pounds to Scotland over the, the period, the 2014 to 20 period. It's page 16 of the strategy document. It's just to ask you, could you set some context hopefully for our discussion that's coming up? Where are we with these programmes? They're worth a substantial amount of money to Scotland. We've had three years to plan 
for whether these programmes will continue in the way that they are or whatever. What are the current arrangements, as you understand it, with the UK government about the continuation of the EU programmes? Well, it's true to say that the figure that Mr Coffey gives is right, that the EU funding is worth over £5 billion to Scotland in this current EU budget round. And, of course, that does support jobs and infrastructure, sustained rural communities and provides valuable support to farming and fishing industries and delivering research for universities. That's the kind of areas that have benefited from that £5 billion, and we have no certainty um, uh, over the medium and longer term around what the replacement funding would be from the, uh, from the UK government. The position of the Scottish government has been there should be no financial detriment to Scotland's economy or public finances as a consequence of their exit of uh, the European Union. But we've got no guarantees from the UK government and no detail in some of the specific funding streams. And I'm sure all of that will be revisited by um, the takeover that's happening in the Tory party right now. Mm. So, so there's been three years, convener, to, to, to try to even set some terms of reference for this looking ahead. So for the past three years, the UK government have they've been fighting like ferrets in a sack amongst themselves. There's been no work done in this whatsoever. This is really crucial for the future of Scotland and all of these programmes. Well, 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 the Scottish Government has been trying to do work yeah. on it, but it's hard to deliver successor schemes when we don't know what will succeed the existing schemes from the European Union. There are some commitments from some parts eh, of funding, but not specifically what Scotland would receive, which then determines how we could deploy those resources. Our principle has been no detriment. Um, I'm not sure that that would be delivered. The current persuasion of those vying for the Tory membership don't seem to be too mindful of Scotland's economic needs, and I'm not sure that that will be foremost in the Tory the Prime Minister's mind in terms of making sure that Scotland gets a fair deal, or other devolved administrations get a fair deal, recognising that Scotland didn't vote for this mess, but will be paying for the financial consequences of it. But no, I'm sure there's been work at UK government, but no decisions in terms of the medium and long term continue to the funding and no detail as to what funding we'll receive post-exit. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I thank our witnesses. Uh, I now suspend this meeting for probably around about five minutes before we move to the next item on EU structural funds.
the second item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence in a round table format on the funding of EU structural fund priorities in Scotland post Brexit. Uh, I welcome our witnesses to the meeting. Uh, before we start the discussion, though, I want one member from each of our recent structural funds workshop visits to provide a very brief summary um, about how you felt the sessions went. That we had a session in Inverness. So, Alexander Burnett, would you just like to give us a quick reflection on what how you? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Bruce. As, as you know yourself, uh, uh, Patrick and, and I uh, went to Inverness. Uh, can I start by just thanking the clerks and the parliamentary outreach team and Spice uh, for all their assistance in doing that, uh, but particularly all those uh, who attended. I thought it was an, you know, a very, very valuable uh, session. Uh, I think we were you know, very pleasantly surprised in terms of the volume and, and depth of, of information we received. Uh, and probably the first point is that to, was to learn that with or without Brexit, uh, you know, a major overhaul of the funds was due anyway. Uh, and so, so this is a valuable piece of work uh, being done by the committee, uh, regardless of other events. Um, there were, uh, in summary of some of the information we took, you know, there were a lot of negatives over the uh, ad administration and bureaucracy. Uh, much of which we seem to have created ourselves in Scotland, as a lot of this wasn't replicated elsewhere in other e EU countries. Uh, there were a lot of positive suggestions over how uh, future programmes and objectives uh, could be improved on, uh, particularly with more input from those uh, closer to the delivery uh, aspect of the, the, the funds. Uh, but finally, uh, and most importantly, you know, you know, setting these, you know, these negative points aside uh, and these suggested improvements uh, nothing uh, should detract uh, from a huge uh, positive benefit uh, that these types of funds have brought. Thank Thanks, you. Alexander. And Adam, you're going to cover how you felt about Paisley, how it worked out. Yeah, thank you, Convener. So the um, four members um, uh, w went to the, the Paisley Roundtable, uh, myself, Tom Arthur, Emma Harper, and Neil Bibby. And um, it was, it was uh, as with Alexander's experience of the um, event in, in Vanessa, it was really, it was really excellent. Um, the, um, the range of um, questions that we were able to explore in the time available was exactly gave, it, gave the committee exactly what it needed uh, to know. I think, particularly looking at, um, at people as it were on the ground level who have direct experience, and in some cases, 35 years of direct experience of of, of applying for and processing um, uh, uh, structural funds um, uh, related projects. Um, the, uh, we, we, we talked at length about um, what structural funds are, are for, the strengths and limitations of the, of, the, of the current sets of schemes, about how they are administered and processed, um, and about um, what should replace them, um, you know, whether the United Kingdom uh, leaves the European Union uh, or, or not. Um, uh, and I think there was quite a lot of um, concern around uh, the requirement for match funding, uh, which was a significant um, break on uh, the app, on, on, on <coughs> otherwise valuable um, uh, projects which couldn't be applied for because of the requirement for match funding. There was a lot of concern, a very, a very great deal of concern about the um, bureaucracy uh, for um, both applying for and then once you've got the fund, claiming you know, cl cl claiming it. Um, uh, there, are, there are current problems with the way in which that is working or not working in Scotland, which are or seem to be unique to um, I I IT problems that the Scottish Government have, um, are responsible for. We will certainly need to look at um, <coughs> convener during the course of this inquiry. Um, uh, and uh, there are um, uh, concerns also about the extent to which structural funds replicate um, uh, uh, funding which is available in, in, in other areas. But it seems that one of the problems here is that, you know, there are very kind of fashionable issues. There are good reasons why they're fashionable. Um, you know, skills training for 16 to 19 year olds would be a, would be a good a good example. Um, uh, social care for um, the elderly would be another. And there and there are areas which are which, which fall through the gaps. Um, and so the the, the 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 range of issues covered, um, it was certainly something that was. Um, was, was featured in our in our discussions, but in terms of the the way in which the outreach worked uh, itself, the the length of the meeting, the structure of the meeting, the brief that we had as members from the from the clerks, the number of people in the room, and the range and expertise of the people in the room, it, it was excellent. There were three criticisms of the event. Um, convener, the room was too hot, the coffee was too weak, and the biscuits were too few. <laughs> it was a pretty severe criticism. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Um, James Kelly, are you going to cover what happened in the film? Sure. Uh, thank you, Convener. Murder Fraser and myself attended the workshop in Dunfermline, and like the other workshops, uh, they were well run by the clerks and the Parliament outreach staff, and therefore Murder and I found it very informative. Uh, three kind of 
themes coming across from the workshop. First of all, in terms of the current funding arrangements, people were positive about the, the European Structural Funds and the impact that that had. They felt that it was consistent in terms of policy outcomes from an EU, UK and Scottish Government perspective, in terms of helping businesses create jobs, uh, raising awareness around climate change targets and helping contribute towards that, and also uh, in some communities helping with social inclusion. In terms of the actual process, from a positive point of view, people felt the, the aspect of multi-year funding was a, a good one, and they felt that the leader programme worked well in terms of getting funding quickly to uh, those that had applied for grants. Uh, however, there was a good deal of uh, frustration around the process. It was felt it was overly complex. Uh, the audit requirements were quite um, uh, took quite a lot of time, um, and there was an, an element of duplication in that a lot of groups already had their own uh, audit requirements that they had to satisfy for uh, public money. So there was an element of duplication there. There was quite a big issue around uh, filling out and auditing timesheets uh, in order to be able to claim for staff resources, and that actually resulted in you know staff not actually you know allocating all their their time to the project that they were working on um a bit like the, the other workshops there was criticism around the it and it was felt as well that the communication within projects and also about projects was poor so taking all that together the, the kind of lessons that i learned in terms of moving forward uh, is that people are keen to see uh, multi-year funding uh, continue. Uh, they want to see that allocated at a Scottish level. Uh, there are, there's got to be a much simpler process in place in terms of managing the allocation of money and the administration of that. Uh, and there's also got to be better communication within projects and also uh, making people aware, particularly in, in rural uh, and uh, other communities of the, the project or the, of the potential to apply for uh, uh, you know structured f uh, fund money um, because it, it wasn't maybe reaching all the places that it could so a very good uh, workshop and some important lessons coming out from it Bruce okay well thank you for the members giving us a flavor and some of that feedback and uh, hopefully it'll let those who are involved in the round table to today understand just how deeply we're going into this subject now seriously we're treating it and we now move into that round table discussion this round table format is intended to be a free-flowing discussion as much as we can those who've been involved before in these discussions will know what i mean if you want to get, contribute just catch the eye of myself or jane or clark here and we'll make sure you get in to see your piece at any particular time um and the discussion is going to be based around three themes or allocation of funding process and administration and outcomes and just to kick off each session i'm going to ask one of the msps just to introduce it uh, and we can then get into that free-flowing discussion and that exchange of views which i think will be very valuable to the committee tom arthur are you going to kick off the process thank you very much convener and good morning and welcome to all our guests uh, the first area the committee is interested in exploring as convener highlighted is the allocation of funding so with a proposed UK Shared Prosperity Fund, there is a potential for a tabula rasa and to begin again and do something completely new or to mirror existing arrangements. Should we move to a system of a centrally administrative fund run by the UK government? Should we try to, as I say, replicate what we have at the moment? Or should we look for new opportunities to be more bespoke, to more meet um, local needs and demands? So the committee is very keen to hear the views and how funding should be allocated, who should administer it, and importantly, what the criteria should be and what the decision-making process should be. So I would like to open this up to guests to contribute. We're very keen to hear your views. Okay, Dougal, you as a man who's ready to give us a, some thoughts. <laughs> okay, I mean, I, I think in, in terms of the administration of funds, the, the starting point should be the, the government white paper that says that one of the reasons we're going to repatriate funds is so that we can increase subsidiarity and devolve funding um, to the, um, the devolved nations. And so I think 
it's obvious from that then that the funding should be uh, administered at least at devolved nation level. Uh, in terms of the um, approach to it, I think that we've taken a silo approach up to now in Scotland. Uh, if you look at a country like Wales or even Latvia, they've looked at all of the European funds together to see how they can work in some sort of harmony to achieve various objectives. And we haven't taken that approach in Scotland. You know, it's a bit like the black arts, which is, I think, one of the reasons are a, a communication problem. There's a lot of a, a lot of funding available, but if you're a community group or you're a, an education group that's got a really good idea, if you don't happen to know about the funding stream that's available to help you to do that, then you might never get that sort of funding, because you know it's, the way it's handled in Scotland is it's if you happen to know stuff about it, you you tend not to have a, a, a medium to share it, and we even found that sitting in the room that before we came in here that all of us knew different things about different areas of the funding. So I think that's something that's got to be really important for the future, is that there's coherence across all of the funds. And I don't think you as a, a committee should just look at um, ESIF. You should be looking at the whole range of funding in Europe that's going to be repatriated and what the Scottish share would be and how all of that can be harnessed. OK, Dougal, thank you for that beginning contribution. Kate, I, I know you're... you're your own organisation submitted quite a useful paper. Do you want to reflect on some of that? Yeah, um, in terms of that, I would echo quite a lot of what uh, Dougal just said there a minute ago. And we want to see a more collaborative approach. It's really quite difficult for the third sector to be able to align at a local level when they don't necessarily know all the funds that are available and what's happening at that level. So I think we want to kind of keep the principles of devolution of the fund, that the funding should um, represent the streams um, from across the different programmes, not just the structural funds, and that there should be a sense of the Scottish Government holding accountability, but regional partnerships and regional organisations working together, and also local community-based organisations having much more access to the funds. At the moment, it is very, very difficult for community-based organisations and third sector organisations to actually really engage effectively in the processes. Feel free. Does anybody want to? Susan? Uh, yeah, just pick up on some of those points that Kate had made there. So I suppose for, for us, there's something interesting about how we get the balance Right, so uh, from most of the evidence I've seen, certainly our own position, there seems to be a sense that it would be far more practical and sensible for Scottish Government um, to manage uh, the funding, certainly from our point of view in terms of economic development, that would align better with current functions. Then there's also um, quite a lot of interest in greater community decision making around um, European funding. The issue for us is how do you get that balance right? So on the one hand, if you think about how some of the leader funding, which obviously not structural funding, but the leader funding is a really important source of economic development support for businesses and rural communities in particular, there's quite a different approach there in terms of the leader action groups and how they develop their strategies compared to elements of structural funding. Now, that's seen as a positive, but on the other hand, if there's too much um, local decision making, what we have tended to notice happens is there can be a tendency to duplicate. Everybody wants to come up with their own scheme when there may already be a national programme or service. Um, so for us, we, appreciate, we think that the balance has to be somewhere between an element of national control by Scottish Government to provide oversight, a strategic framework, but we appreciate that there is a demand for more local input to how funds are spent. Okay. Ross? Yeah, I, I think I'd echo that. It's, there's an opportunity to reset the, the way in which funds are, are managed uh, in light of all the experience and frustration and, and, and benefit. And um, I think it's form needs to follow function. So th I th I would, we would agree that it makes sense for the Scottish Government to oversee this and for the funds, we'll come on to outcomes, but for the funds to be targeted at the outcomes decided at a Scottish level. But the way in which those funds are then managed should be designed around the benefit that's being sought. And that no one size approach is going to deliver that so it will be a range of things from a local a regional and a national approach so I think it would it, it, it would make sense not to rule out any of those at this stage but to see which would be the best way in light of the experience we had to deliver the benefits we're seeking can I just ask you because you Ross you'll see quite a, a, a range of things that happen from your own organization and, and Dougal made the point about creating more synergy effectively between the funds 
uh, than currently exists. Is that the experience of SNH? Yeah, I, I think very much so. That there's both both in our approach in managing this fund and the experience of applicants to our uh, strategic interventions within uh, the Regional Development Fund. The the challenge in accessing and, and identifying other potential sources of funding. So, and it seems as though most applicants are having to conduct that exercise independently um, and, and reaching different answers and often being unaware of funds that other similar groups elsewhere in the country are, are managing to access. So I very much recognize the picture that people have, the complexity of what we've got currently isn't helpful. And there are, it's not just the European funds, it's alignment to funds like um, the, uh, the growth deal money or, or the funds that are going to be managed under the National Infrastructure Commission and uh, the, the Scottish Futures Fund. They they're all have a related function, but at the moment it appears to be more fragmented than it needs to be and in fragmented in a way that's unhelpful in delivering the benefits. Okay. Rashir, Nora? Um, yes. For us, obviously, um, so I'm from the Equality and Human Rights Commission. For us, the main concern is around ensuring that there is no regression in terms of equality and human rights and the funding that this receives. So um, we've actually recently published a report looking at this. And as part of that research, we interviewed various stakeholders across Great Britain. And again, some of the things that came from those stakeholders were things that have already been mentioned. So the importance of long-term funding, but um, also the importance of having the funding and the decisions devolve to an appropriate local level. So we do think there is um, there is a space or there's the importance of a UK-wide strategy with sort of very broad priorities, but that you also have local priorities. So that might be Scottish priorities, but also more priorities that are based on the local communities that the funding goes to and that really targets the needs of uh, marginalized groups, but also people with and who share protected characteristics. Sheer, do you want to sure, yeah. give your contribution? I mean, this will build on what Nora has said. Um, I think for us, the starting point for this is it's about people in communities. And this is a really important resource uh, a stable resource over a period of seven years where we can have, uh, as James quite rightly pointed out, um, something that's slightly more independent from the immediate policy requirements of any level of government. And, and so it's a really important resource for uh, people that are supported by the third sector and others. Uh, and so it's really important that we keep that resource, we, we replace it, we make sure that there is an allocation that, that comes through to replace that. Uh, specifically and directly. Now, I think the key point I would like to make is uh, there isn't actually a Brexit dividend, as far as I could tell. I mean, the Institute of Fiscal Studies and others have all outlined that there isn't going to be um, uh, a money coming back it, because, it, because Brexit itself is going to be a net cost. So as a result of that, what that really means in terms of allocation is that it's going to be a top slice from existing resources at a UK level, including the Scottish Block Grant. And if that is the case, then any money that is coming through that is pooled at a UK level um, will be at the expense of other resources. So um, on, a, on, a very on a default level, if there is no UK-based uh, replacement, such as a shared prosperity fund, then uh, if the UK government decides to spend it on uh, a devolved priority, such as health, then it would get barneted across to the Scottish Block Grant. Um, if they decide to keep a central fund, then again, we would push for uh, um, a shared allocation of that. We would be very keen for a, 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 you know, uh, a fair share of that to come through to Scotland as well. So I think the key, key point for me, for us, is that uh, any resources that are replacing uh, the, the function of the, Brex of the uh, European funds needs to be fully accountable to the Scottish Parliament. I think that's the starting point for us. And the reason for that is coherence, policy coherence, and alignment with all the existing uh, um, policy areas which closely relate to the kind of function that we're currently seeing with uh, um, LEADER and uh, ESF and others in Scotland right now. Okay, can I just, from that, can I just ask others what their views are on the size of the, the pot that it should be and on the time scale that that, currently it's seven years, 
taking on point the long-term funding and just to make sure that, because Rashid's raised these points, I want to make sure that others have the chance to contribute about what, what they feel about this, the scale of what will be available and over what term these programmes should be enabled to be spent. Have you got any thoughts on that? Well, Ross? Well, on the, I mean, I think the scale of funding, obviously, it, it would be... <laughs> We should be seeking the, the funding that's required for the challenge and the benefits we're, we're trying to seek, and we, we would we would all argue for more more funds to deliver more benefits. I think, so but I don't think there's much we can offer to the debate that's going to happen at uh, national and UK level on on that. But on on the longevity of the funding, I think it is critical to delivering benefits. The experience that from the current schemes it is critical that we seek to provide uh, security uh, to applicants and longevity of funding in order to deliver benefits uh, there is a real risk in moving to a sort of more annual annualized approach um, to the efficiency of the process and also the confidence that applicants have in applying and their ability to deliver the benefits so maintaining the longevity of the commitment of funding would be really critical to delivering the benefits Dougal, I think you wanted to come yeah. back in. I mean, in terms of the scale of the funding, I mean, I th that's one of the reasons I made the plea that we shouldn't just focus on um, uh, the structural funds. You know, if, if, if the UK government is going to repatriate all of the money it contributes to all of the European programmes, then we should be, as a, any of the devolved nations should be doing, is pushing for a proportionate share that's not less than the population share of that amount. Which is why, in my own paper, I've sort of listed all these other programmes that we need to look at to make sure we get our share. There's no point in going lately. My concern is that the poor performance in structural funds could undermine that argument, because it would be easy enough to say, when well, you've been given this, much of money, uh, this amount of money, you're going to give about a fifth of it back because of the way you've been managing it. So do you need it anyway? So I think we need to we need to be very careful about that. In terms, I agree with you. But in terms of longevity, I mean, to, to keep annualising it is, is not a way to do it. I mean, I think maybe something like five, seven years, where you can set longer term objectives and give projects some sort of security that they're going to be get to the end of the things that they planned. Okay, okay. be good. But okay. So I think longevity is important, but so is responsiveness and flexibility and agility when conditions change. Um, I think we need a programme that doesn't lock us into um, a situation. So, for example, unemployment is low just now, but in a post-Brexit world, we don't know what that's going to be. We don't know what the impact is. So we have to make sure that the programmes are flexible and responsive to what are the changing conditions. OK. Susan? Yeah, sorry, not, not particularly... Uh helpful but this is another question for us where there's a there's a difficult balance to be struck so take the point about the importance of lo longevity because from a customer point of view so the end users of the service we know that it takes a really long time to build up awareness amongst the small business community about a scheme that might be available uh, and often it might end you know just as people are starting to understand that that scheme's available so we understand that point about longevity but similarly We've made a criticism about how we offer business support, whether it's uh, European funded core funding, that um, historically we've been really terrible at being agile enough to respond to economic situations. So I remember um, after the recession, some of the discussions that happened around how to repurpose European funding. And it was a long and painful process to turn around um, a product that would be available to businesses to support the, you know, the really rapid change in economic circumstances. And so we, we need to be able to have a, a framework that enables us to make a change uh, to respond to what businesses need more quickly. Tom, you another point? Yeah, I, I think it would be fair to say there's probably a broad degree of consensus amongst contributors that these funds should be administered from Scotland. Are there any particular views on how these repatriated funds, as Diggle characterised them, should be um, devolved from the UK government to the respective nations? What formula should be used? Population share, Barnet, a, a needs-based formula? Are there any particular views with regards to how the UK its government itself should administer that pot of money to the devolved nations? Sure. Yeah. 
Sure. I mean, I think uh, the the current way in which the European Union allocates it has got a mix of, of approaches in it. They've taken into account things like GDP as well as needs. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, the, the fairest approach which we've outlined would be a population based at the core. There might, there might be some adjustments on top of that, as, as have been suggested by others. But a population base at the core would be helpful because uh, um, that could apply equally to a centralised pot, say a treasury fund, which is a UK shared prosperity fund, and 8.4% of that would be a population based share for Scotland. And it would also, by default, equally apply if there is no uh, centralised pot and it's all de just defaulted to using the, the, the existing system, which would be a Barnett formula, assuming it's not uh, redirected at tax cuts or anything like that. Um, so, so I think that population base should be at the core of, of any uh, allocation formula. But once it does come to Scotland, I think the key thing here, and this goes with the allocation, is that the, uh, let, let's say the Scottish government is administering the funds as a managing authority, as they are right now, they, the accountability should run directly to the Scottish Parliament and solely to the Scottish Parliament for how those funds are used. At the moment, uh, it, it can be a little bit loose. Uh, there can be accountability that takes place to, to the European Commission, to the UK government, to the... So it, that situation is not very good for transparency. It's not very good for participation and openness in, in how the uh, resources are delivered. So I think having the Scottish Parliament having the key role of being the accountable body will make allocations a, a, a lot more, uh, will bring a lot more trust into the way it's allocated. Dougal, then I know Murdo wants to make a point as well. Uh, I would just endorse your, your comments, uh, Rashir's comments about uh, the, the Parliament being ultimately responsible. I mean, I think the decision to take the management of structural funds in house into government was a poor decision. I've been pretty trenchant in my criticism of the, the way it's, the programme's run in my, uh, my paper. Um, so I think, yeah, it's really got to come to the Parliament because I think the way it's gone now is there's almost like a siege mentality in the department that's running it. There's no partnership anymore. And that was one of the things that Scotland was praised for about a decade ago. But partnership working was the, the, the model that was been presented all over Europe because of the way Scotland went about managing funds. That's gone now. These are the, the, the people who manage the funds aren't our partners anymore. You, you feel it, you know, it's the, the, the tax inspectors come to look at you or something. They're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not there to help you. They may think they are, but they don't. So I think, yeah, the parliament's got to take control of it rather than a, a government department. Murdo. It's like the old saying, I'm, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Yes. Yeah, yes, actually. <laughs> so yeah. that wasn't the point I was going to make. Um, uh, let's go back to, to, to Rashir's point about the, the allocation of funds, and you, you said you, know, you wanted it population-based. I just wonder if, if, you, if you don't think that would put a cap on the amount of money that would come to Scotland, because I think historically we've done better than our population share from structure funds. So if we're based on population, does that not mean that we could end up losing out? Yeah, we, we addressed this in our briefing, as you mm -hmm. know. Uh, for us, better targeting an alignment of funding to the people and communities that, that our sector supports is so much more important than you know as having slightly less money than we currently have through European funding. Because at the end of the day, you can have a system where more money or the same money comes to Scotland, um, but the way it's allocated means that less money comes to people and communities. So we would rather flip that over the other way around. I, I related to that, and not, not just for here, but for whoever wants to answer, why should it be based on population rather than need? I mean, if the, if the purpose of shared prosperity fund or structural funds or whatever you want to call them is to address need in areas of multiple deprivation, which is certainly what we heard in, in our group in, in Renfrewshire and Paisley, um, then why should, it, why should it have anything to do with the number of people who happen to live in a nation or region of the United Kingdom? Why should it not be focused on need? Right, Anne, who's taking that one on? Okay. I think we advocated okay. a combination of a needs-based approach based on the priorities um, around what we wanted to tackle. So start with end in mind in terms of what was the equalities kind of thing that we wanted to make sure in terms of a smarter, greener, safer um, Scotland. And, um, but also fully funding rather than match funding, because that's been a nightmare in terms of the allocation and the underspend because people can't kind of work out 
where that matches that they get from somewhere else in advance of a project is just creating a huge amount of barrier. People going around trying to search for the match funding, making sure it's clean match funding, that the organisation, they almost have to do an audit of who they collaborate with in order to put the package together. So I think it's if you can have fully funded, needs-based, and um, we proposed Barnet plus 10%, so we wanted, but we did debate other options. So I think the most important thing is that it goes to the people that need it and we can't afford to send money back to the EU when we have people that really need the money. Nora? Yeah, just to reiterate what Kate said, I mean, we haven't specifically looked at the kind of formula that should be used, but um, again, for us, it's about ensuring that it reaches the people who need it the most, it reaches marginalised groups that... Um, like you said, a lot of the stakeholders we talked to um, mentioned the issue around finding match funding and the sort of administrative burden that is linked to the current funding that's available. And another thing that actually one of the stakeholders um, brought up, a Scottish stakeholder during the research, was that if, for example, it comes to a hard Brexit, you'll actually see an increase in marginalised groups. You'll see an increase in the people who will require that type of funding. So that's probably something to take into account when you think about allocation as well, that the sort of like need that's there right now might change depending on how Brexit goes. So can, can I just clarify that? Because that's a very interesting perspective given the organization that you represent. So from an equality and human rights perspective, you, you wouldn't have an argument against the formula being needs-based uh, like I said, we haven't looked at that specifically. We haven't looked at the formula. What we've looked at is um, the funding that's available for equality and human rights issues at the moment and ensuring that that stays in place. Now, the formula you use across the UK, like um, Rashir has pointed out, it might actually be that there's a different formula that allocates less money to Scotland, but if it's used in a different way, it might reach more people. So. We, ha we don't have a position on that, per se. Right. We're really beginning to begin already getting to drill down into the process and administration area. So, James, do you just want to, since we're into that territory anyway, do you just want to just formally get us into yeah, that sure. discussion? Yeah, um, uh, sure. This, this section sort of looks at process and administration. I mean, one of the things that surprised me at the Dunfermon workshop was how cumbersome and complex the process and administration of uh, applying and allocating and managing the funds was. Um, so obviously this is uh, public money, money, so there needs to be uh, a method of monitoring and, account and accountability around that. Um, and that's got to be balanced up against a, an audit process and compliance process that's not too complex and not duplicating work in other areas. Um, so the, the the question is, how do we lessen the learn learn the lessons from the process that we've been using previously, where there are uh, there is a, a, an element of criticism and frustration with it, and put in place a new streamlined process which speeds up the allocation of money, getting to uh, local groups quicker, uh, but also ensures that there's transparency around how that money's been managed. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the good news is there's a huge amount of literature and research now available to show what a good funding program would look like, learning from a lot of lessons in the past. So that, that's not going to be a problem, and certainly we can share some of that with the committee afterwards. Um, so, so I think, you know, the, the, the issue here, which is that uh, the current system is very bureaucratically uh, burdensome, is definitely shared by everyone, certainly that I have ever spoken to that uses European uh, resources or European funding, except when it's, it's, there's an intermediary um, w which provides a grant scheme to try and take that burden away. And, if, and as you can imagine, with uh, 27 other, 27 countries involved in the European Commission, that's why we have got that burdensome system in place. And without that, of course, we won't need to do that quite in the same way. So, you know, um, the, the one opportunity that we do have here is to reduce the, uh, the burden, is to reduce the administrative uh, um, requirements and to make it much more open, transparent and streamlined. Uh, and the information on how to do that is definitely available, which we can share with you. Cool. 
Yeah, I mean, I, 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 like many of the, the respondents, have been very, very critical of the way this has been handled. But I mean, the, the, on the other hand, it's not restricted to some of the programmes that are managed in Scotland. The UK seems to take a gold plating approach to things and um, makes things a little bit more burdensome than they are elsewhere. But um, there are lots of examples of good practice out there, and I think we should be looking at those now. And there's good examples uh, of good practice from the past that we could look at and fine-tune them so we could use them. So um, there's hopefully still a legacy of some knowledge around it of previous iterations of the programme that were seem to um, be managed uh, in a more streamlined, more transparent and less cumbersome fashion that we can learn from. And as I cited earlier, there's good examples in Wales, good examples in Latvia, where we can go and look at what they're doing. Understand that UK government and um, Scottish government have been looking at what's happening in Switzerland because Switzerland works in this bilateral thing. I would urge you not just to look at that because if you, if you speak to the Swiss government, they'll tell you it's great. Go and speak to the Swiss institutions, they'll give you a different picture. So, I mean, I, I think you need to, and also, it's not as complicated as the things that we're trying to do. So, but there are examples and we, could, we should learn from those. Kate, did I see you wanting to come in there? Y yeah, well, I think we've argued for a third sector kind of governing body, managing agent body, representing the third sector. Why? Because, um, and I think it could be based on some of the previous um, partnership approaches that we've had in Scotland, where you really have um, people who know the sector, working with the sector, and supporting the capacity building in the sector, because all of the technical assistance that used to support partnership working in the past has been removed from the current programmes and been replaced by an audit and compliance um, regime, which is actually incredibly difficult and passes the burden of cash flow and underwriting a lot of the activity by the third sector who ultimately doesn't get paid for it um, because it's become so complex to actually draw down the funding. So we would argue for more collaborative approaches and that real sense of um, the managing of, of the, the funding being a collaborative, transparent, open um, decision-making process. Ross? Well, just to echo that, really, I, I, I think the, the burden of and complexity of European funding is, you know, it, it's it's well known and something that we must try and move away from while maintaining rigour and transparency. You know, we mustn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But on that, the other elements of, of how the fund's administered, I, I think it is this, this issue about the, the importance of advice and support and capacity building, which can get lost, you know, and, and needs to be part of the thinking about any future scheme that in order to deliver the benefits, you need those elements as well. It's not just the money. Um, and often they're overlooked or they come in last minute. And, uh, and the, as Kate said, you know, in the sector we work in, some of that advice <coughs> capacity has been lost. And, it, you know, it's to the detriment of what we've been trying to achieve. I think there's also choices about administering about challenge funds and co-production. So there are things where you're looking to be more innovative and there isn't a sort of established expertise where a challenge fund approach might be more appropriate to generate some innovation and new ideas. But where you're seeking to fund and support well-established um, aims and, and organisations with capacity and, and a track record, then a co-production approach would be much more appropriate. And that's something... Uh, we, in the particular areas we're working in, I think we, we based on the experience we've had thus far, we, we w it, w it would have been better to go down a co-production route, but we've gone down a challenge fund route because of the design of the scheme. But, you know, that's something we've learned from. And it's, it's another element of the choices about how a scheme is administered and choosing the right design of a scheme to deliver the aims you want. And, you know, challenge fund or co-production is one element of that. It certainly was a theme that came through in Inverness that if we're starting with a clean sheet of paper, assuming that there's going to be a sort of fund, whatever that might look like, wherever it's distributed, that why do we need to even look to what other European countries are doing in terms of the way they manage funds? Why don't we, and, and to avoid duplication, why don't we just use the current Scottish government funding models when they fund bodies uh, for other purposes, which, from what I understand, weren't as cumbersome and we'd, we'd, we'd streamline the process, but, but, but that might that may have been a view just from the islands and islands. So is it possible to do it that way? Just using, you know, Dougal. 
I oh, certainly have to comment on my paper that you know there's a lighter touch taken uh, to managing a whole lot of other public funds, and why is that not applied to these funds? I mean, uh, although I said we could learn from experience, and I do think we can learn from the experience elsewhere. Unfortunately, the way it's been presented for years and years here is not learning from experience. It's the bogeyman will come and get us if we do it this way. You know, so there's always a big baddie somewhere that gets blamed for this rule that's in place, when in actual fact it's a self-imposed rule from within here. So as long as it, learning from experience it doesn't get turned around and subverted to be some excuse for not having transparency. But in, your, in your experience, though, the way that the Scottish Government manages its own programmes that yeah. aren't tied to currently to the Commission in terms of the rules that you are to follow, is that a, a, a process that's more less bureaucratic? Is it a process that allows for that co-production that we're talking about uh, in terms of how the funds are distributed? She's yeah, the, the, the leader programme has been excellent. It's been very much a bottom-up-led approach, uh, pioneered, I think, in the Republic of Ireland and, and then replicated elsewhere. And in Scotland, there's been a very good version of that, which has worked very well and has, has a lot of trust in it. Now, that's not an ESF um, programme, but uh, it, it still has... Uh, I, I know it's within the remit of, of the committee here. So there's things we can learn from that. I think the key thing is... Uh, what we don't definitely don't want to do is to replicate the, the current way in which the managing authority in Scotland is running the structural funds and the kind of methods used there. But there are other funds that the Scottish Government uh, runs and others run, which can, can be a good example there. And I think one of the key points I would raise is that we have an excellent uh, national performance framework in a set of Scottish national outcomes now. Let's use that to frame it. Angela? Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I think there's always an opportunity to, to do things differently and uh, learn from experience. I suppose what I'm also interested as well as learning the lessons from the 2014 to 2020 set of programmes, uh, I'm also aware that there was earlier programmes. Um, my memory is somewhat rusty, but I think there were some issues there that led to change that's reflected in the current programme. So I think it's important that we're you know, learning all the lessons, you know, from our own past, and as well as, um, you know, best international practice, if, if we want to put it that way. In terms of how all of this hangs together, we've got delivery bodies, lead agencies, and the, the, the management authority, which is currently uh, the Scottish Government. But if, and I'm not necessarily arguing against this, but if the Scottish Parliament, as opposed to the government, was the ultimate accountable body. How then does that work with, say, you know, a third sector, you know, broader partnership body? Because Parliament can hold the government to account and be very specific in pressing. But how would Parliament hold, you know, organisations external to this place to account? Um, bearing in mind that as well as stripping out bureaucracy and, uh, uh, you know, uh, dealing with the needless uh, bogeymen, there is also a need, you know, for some level of scru scrutiny and accountability uh, for what at the end of the day will be public money. Yeah, and who would scrutinise what the Parliament does? The voters. OK, sorry. <laughs> Angela's question. <laughs> Dougal, go. I mean, it might not be the correct answer, but um, no correct answer. we're going to have to have a body that manages this funding in some way. Now, we've got plenty of examples of how different bodies can run things. So uh, it's, it's, one way you can do it is um, you could, that body could be accountable to the parliament for what it does. You can entrust it to meet certain standards and then you can call it to account after that. You don't have to bring every single project in and ask them what they're doing. That body can be responsible for doing that. I mean... Funding Council does it with all the funding for the colleges and the universities. Um, so can't you use a similar sort of model for that? Mm. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not suggesting the Funding Council is a model, but I mean... <laughs> I, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, actually, I, I'm less anxious about this than maybe it might be. Other, because I think uh, if the Scottish Parliament is the ultimate accountable body, <coughs> rather than the European Commission or whatever it might be, then, it, then even if it's within the Scottish Government, it's fine. It'll still work because you'll be able to scrutinise that fully. Now, I, I think we've been quite clear that third sector, alongside others, should be 
trusted to be able to like run funds themselves. Um, and of course, that would be then uh, you know, commissioned by the Scottish Government, of course it would be. And there's already examples of that where a third sector runs funds which are commissioned by uh, the, the Scottish Government. But the key thing is, when it comes to scrutiny, um, the, the route through is, is going to be through the Scottish Government, it's going to be to the Scottish Parliament. It's not going to be through the Scottish Government to the European Commission or to some other body or that, and you know, all sorts of muddiness in terms of who's accountable. Having a really clear sense of accountability to the Scottish Parliament, I think, frees us up to be able to um, bring in resources and also lots of agencies that then have a clear route in through the Scottish Government to the Scottish Parliament. Anybody else before we come back to Dugald? Dugald, and then Kate. Uh, and the, the model, I've, I've just had a chance to reflect. I mean, we have a model at the minute for, let's take the Erasmus Plus programme, where the managing authority is the uh, Department for Education in the UK government. But the management of the programme is devolved, to, uh, it's run under contract with the British Council and the CORUS. So all of the decisions and, uh, about running the programme um, on a day -to -day, uh, an operational day-to-day -day basis and all of the verification and all the audit procedures are handled by that agency. But they report to the government department, who then reports to Parliament. We, we could take the same approach here. Okay. I was actually going to echo a very sort of similar model, and for many years we ran those kinds of models. Um, if you go right back to the beginning of structural funds in Scotland, we had um, partnership organisations that directly reported and were accountable to to um, government here, but they had a, a, a real professional expertise in supporting partners and managing the funds. Nora? Um, just talking about sort of the monitoring and evaluation of funds, um, one thing that we found with our research was that actually the data available on equalities was very weak when it comes to Scotland and there was data available for Wales and England through DWP that we could use and if you look at our report we have sort of very nice maps of Wales and, and England where we go into more information on uh, the beneficiaries of the funds and what sort of protected characteristics benefited the most from it but we couldn't do that for Scotland because the information wasn't available so um, while the stakeholders that we talked to and we ourselves really stress the importance for you know, addressing the administrative burden that currently exists, there's also an argument to be made for um, focusing on the collecting and monitoring the right sort of data. And obviously, protected characteristics is really key to that. Susan? Just a really, really quick point. I mean, obviously, we, we can only comment from a sort of business user perspective on the funds that, that, that benefit businesses. But I suppose one concern that we've got is that if we're starting from a blank sheet of paper, say there's a new agency set up or whatever to manage the funds, that we don't lose sight of a lot of the lessons we're learning at the moment about how we currently manage funding and programmes to business. So, um, you know, on the negative side, it's recently been an inquiry into business support in Scotland, there are issues around how we manage a sort of national framework project that's delivered locally. There are issues around how we do that effectively in terms of understanding who's accountable for that if things don't go the way we all expect them to. So, you know, I'd be keen that whoever has a role managing this understands those lessons that have been learned in other areas of Scottish government activity. You know, on a plus side, for example, on the back of the Enterprise and Skills Review, I understand Scottish Enterprise is completely revamping how it delivers grants to businesses and have put a lot of thought into how they would get the process to work from a business approaching to actual grant award. And so that kind of knowledge, all of the work that's gone into how we would make that work, we'd want to make sure that that was carried over to however the funds are deployed in future. That's very useful. OK, I'm gonna, Willie, before we move on. Bruce, thanks. I wonder if I could just come in on that point that Nora raised there about poor data eh, on certain issues. Um, for a number of years, I, I try, as a member of the Parliament, and I'm sure colleagues do, to find out things about your constituency that you represent in Scotland, and you very rarely get it. You'll get information and data pertaining to local authorities and so on and so forth, but you very rarely get information relating to your own community, which the Parliament elects us to come to represent. So is there a, a job of work to be done, do you think, to start to collect data on a per constituency basis or a regional basis in Scotland so that we can properly reflect the outcomes that we'll be interested in achieving? 
Right, and Emma's got a question as well, so before I'll, I'll come back to the, the body. Funding's really complex, and so I have interest in uh, um, common agricultural policy. Currently, it's Scottish Government manages, but there's going to be future changes. We've got major differences in Scotland with 85% less favoured areas, but there's pillar one, pillar two. It's all very complicated. So, And it might be a question for Dougal or Ross to answer is, where would we then propose that we manage funding for the rural farmers and the food producers in Scotland? Well, yeah, that's, quite, that's quite a big question, actually. Um, but listen, we've got a couple of minutes to reflect on what Willie said or what Emma has said. So is anyone going to pick up in any of that? Well, Ross, yeah. just, just on Emma's point, I mean, there's a whole separate uh, body of work happening in government and um, with various organisations like ourselves and lots of reports being gathered, led by other uh, ministers. So... I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you, uh, catch up with you afterwards, just to explain how, how we're trying to contribute to that as part of that complicated picture you, you've set out. Okay, do go, and then I'm going to just say that, that, you know, the organisation I worked for um, a number of years ago submitted information to um, various government departments of how a Scottish national funding agency could be set up, could be administered, could be run, and so what you would have then is anyone who had an idea or from any sector, could come along to that agency and find out what sort of levels of support would be available, what sort of programmes would be appropriate. At the moment, it's a guessing game, and we need to get away from that so that folks that need the money or can use it usefully can get it. Just a, a brief thought. Um, that we've tended to think about funding in terms of rural and then enterprise and economy, and we haven't been terribly great at seeing the rural economy as part of the economy and enterprise funding. Um, and so there might be, not, notwithstanding all of the positives about LEADER, there may well be an opportunity to, to bring that funding a bit more, a bit closer to existing economic development and enterprise approaches. Just a better coherence and alignment rather than it sitting off to one side. Nora, I think you wanted to... Um, yeah, my point was more about uh, data collection. So... I mean, I think when it comes to the projects funded by EU funding, obviously they will have different reaches in terms of what areas they cover. But again, I think it's more about collecting that data and enabling or creating a system that properly shares that and that enables, that makes it easier for organizations, for parliamentarians to access it and to actually see who are the beneficiaries and who are the people in the local community and where those needs are that are supposed to be met. OK, listen, I'm going to move on to outcomes, because already, and Patrick, I'm sorry, as usual, the person who's in the last seat in this situation usually finds that a lot of the areas have already been covered, and we have been covering some issues around outcomes already. So maybe get about 10 minutes around outcomes, etc., and see where we get to. Thanks, thanks, Kamina. Um, I think it's inevitable that there's some overlap between these mm. different themes that we're, that we're talking about, but I've been asked to, to uh, kind of kick off the discussion on... on uh, issues around how to achieve flexibility in the way that these, these funds or replacement funds are managed to, to achieve uh, the best outcomes for Scotland. And I think um, certainly in the discussion in Inverness, and I'm not sure if that happened in the other workshops, there were some people who were looking at what we know, the limited amount we know about um, the, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund's uh, remit, uh, saying to tackle inequalities between communities by raising productivity, especially in those parts of the UK whose economies are farthest behind. Uh, some people were concerned that that focus on productivity, while important, might close down the opportunity to address whether it's social or environmental uh, purposes, uh, perhaps some of the human rights issues that were mentioned earlier, uh, or indeed inequality within communities as opposed to between communities. Um, and there's also the, the point that uh, Rashia made about the, um, the SCVO submission, if I can bring it up, uh, mentions the, the national performance framework and the, the, national, the Scottish national outcomes, uh, which you know, people might have views about whether they're, they're correctly framed or not, but they have achieved some degree of consistency over time and they've tended not to become political footballs too much. Is that the right approach for for how we frame the outcomes that we're looking to achieve uh, and how do we make sure that, uh, that Scotland has the ability to set that, that framing uh, rather than being constrained by the, 
the way the, the UK fund is, uh, is, is given a remit, or other other approaches? Well, Rashir, you mentioned you, so maybe you'd like to <laughs> reflect on that first. Yes, I think the, the National Performance Framework is the right framework. And the reason for that is quite simple. In this iteration of the National Performance Framework and National Outcomes is specifically backed and linked to the Sustainable Development Goals, which is probably the closest thing we have currently to a strategy for a more positive planet than it, given everything else that's happening around the world. So absolutely the right kind of focus. And uh, within that, uh, we have got uh, human rights uh, aspects and equality aspects covered. Uh, we have got the link to responsibility to uh, tackling climate change covered. So I think uh, you know that is a really good framework for us to to use because it, it has a lot of trust from from a whole range of sectors from people, uh, and it's also got an international credibility because it's now integrated with the Sustainable Development Goals. Emily, let's like reflect on that, and is that the right model? If, if, and if it's not, what else could we use? Ross? Yeah, well, as a public body, that's, that's the model we follow and, and, and work to, and you know, it's a very helpful framework for, for us in deciding on our priorities. But uh, I, I was thinking, in terms of delivering outcomes, what, whatever the framework you're, we're, you're working towards, there's a couple of options about how to achieve that. So there, there is the option which is in in the current system of having horizontal themes that where you want all the money to be uh, spent and uh, and delivered in a way that complies with some common principles so whether that's fairness equality human rights sustainability inclusiveness you know would be the, the phrase at the moment in terms of uh, economic inclusive and sustainable economic growth so there is the option to design a scheme where those are fundamental principles within it that all the money needs to demonstrate that it complies with that or it doesn't it isn't having a contrary effect to those aims and then above that you have targeted funds you know that want to deliver specific outcomes and it's important to remember the the relevance of both to those in delivering what you know the framework of policy outcomes that uh, you're trying to achieve through the money they, they both have a role there's a certain coherence about all that isn't there in terms of who we are so do you have got a different view to that or any any other ways we could be achieving the outcomes for a as for a country that we want to we just yeah. emphasize the, the 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 comparison between what's being discussed here and this that what the limited amount we know about the, the the uk plans this this remit around productivity and inequality between communities does that give enough flexibility uh, you know it's obviously not too late to try and influence the detail of that when it's designed but would, would that give enough flexibility, or do we need to try and encourage a different approach, a broader approach? Question. So okay, on you go. Pick up on that. I think we do need to encourage a broader approach. I think that could become quite narrowly defined over time. And I think um, the national outcomes, great. I think they are ones that people have bought into a smart, you know, sustainable um, future. But I think we can't forget the needs of communities and, and, young, and people and young people in particular from my point of view who are very f frightened actually about the future in terms of Brexit and they really need to think that the services that are being designed put them at the centre as well as you know thinking about just the programme requirements and needs it does need to have a sense that the, the beneficiaries the people at the centre of this and the communities their satisfaction with the whole system is taken into account and actually drives the system as well. Nora, I saw you nodding your head there. You want to? Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that we found is that it's particularly difficult for smaller organisations, sort of underground um, organisations, to apply for funding because of the administrative burden and other things that we already mentioned. So I think what Kate said makes a lot of sense that if if you take that into account, it becomes easier for organizations that are a bit smaller and that maybe previously thought this wasn't an area they could get involved with, that they would engage with that more as well, and that you reach more um, marginalized groups and people with or who share protective characteristics, characteristics through that. Okay, I think there's a general consensus around that in terms of what I'm hearing around the table. Now, does anyone else want to make any particular points that have not been raised today? That you want to make sure you get on on the on the on the record before I bring this very useful session, which is slightly shorter than we expected, but still I think we've got a lot of information from you. 
very a lot of very good information in a short space of time and given us a, a good idea of the sort of architecture and the map we're going to need to deal with this in, in the future. So I'm very, very grateful to all our witnesses sincerely for coming along this morning uh, and obviously that will help draw together for a report which we'll produce sometime in the autumn uh, and uh, hopefully you'll see some of your input reflected in that report and in the meantime I suspend the, the meeting to allow uh, the change of our witnesses. Thank you very much.
Uh, the third item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the additional dwelling supplement from Kate Forbes, the Minister for Public Finance and the Digital Economy. Uh, and, and Kate Forbes is joined this morning by Scottish Government official Ewan Cameron Nielsen. Uh, so I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and I invite the Minister, if she so wishes, to make a opening statement. Just uh, really briefly, thanks for the invitation today. And I know that you're here to quiz me, but I'm actually very interested in what the committee's scrutiny is when it comes to ADS. Because looking back in terms of its uh, introduction, committee members will be aware that it was partly in response to the UK government's decision to introduce that higher rate of SDLT. And we introduced uh, in response to that because of the obvious impact it would have on the housing market and on uh, BGAs. But whilst it's generally been successful in terms of uh, raising revenue, I recognise that various concerns have been raised uh, over the course of the last few, year, few years, particularly in regard to specific individual cases. And two points to make uh, about those calls for changes, many of which I'm quite sympathetic to, is that first it highlights the need to think more generally about how we make changes to devolved taxes in future. And secondly, in terms of the changes that are called for, how we balance individual specific situations with the potential for unintended consequences in a very complex tax. Okay. Well, the committee did hear um, from a, a number of concerns, including a, quite a useful paper from the Law Society, and there were other issues beyond that in relation to the operation of ADS uh, and house buyers who were not intended to be subject to the tax having to pay it, but then, not un then unable to, to reclaim uh, through the due process that's available to others. Do you think that is the case? And what would the government intend to do about it? So when it comes to that particular example, one of the challenges which I think came through to the committee when they took evidence was uh, the evidence base, the challenge around the evidence base. So our main source of evidence is through Revenue Scotland and they um, take evidence uh, that's only applicable to their requirement to collect taxes. And when it comes to the impact, for example, on the private rented sector, which faces a whole host of different uh, you know, pressures, that private rented sector has remained pretty steady at 15%. If you look at the SFC's evidence, they suggest that any foregone revenue is being replaced by the, the policy objective, which is to encourage first-time time buyers into the market. So we have, the, when it comes to supporting the bill-to-rent sector, have that exemption, which was called for in the committee's um, stage one report, to uh, ensure that you know, there's an exemption about six properties or more. But our general analysis of the private rented sector, bill-to-rent, and the housing market more generally, is that it remains strong. There was one specific item which we, 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 the committee received written evidence from one individual, which I think Murdo has had a particular interest in. Murdo, I, I don't know if that's the issue you want to raise with the minister, but please feel free. Yes, to I will. Th 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 thank you, Camina. Good morning, um, uh, Minister. I mean, I think in, in terms of the round table, I think I think you could probably group the two two different areas of of issues that we raised. There were there were issues that were raised around uh, what we would call the the distortion effects. Of the tax, so that was in relation to the issue you talked about, the private rental sector, which is one kind of basket of issues to be looked at. But there's another um, range of issues which were around what you might say were uh, anomalies with the tax, and, and there's one specific anomaly which which came up. Members of the committee will remember the the, the, the Lands and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Scotland Act 2016 that, that the Scottish government introduced to deal with a, a specific anomaly that had been introduced, which I think people all recognised were not an intended consequence of, of the original legislation where, you know, if there was um, a, a, a couple who had bought a property in joint names where it turned out uh, that the, 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 the previous property they occupied only had, had one name on the title, they were not able to reclaim ADS and therefore were facing a penalty and that was not in the spirit of the original legislation and that was, that was cured. And now what's come to light is that there's another anomaly has, has arisen, which, which is similar but slightly different circumstance, where you have a couple who are living at separate addresses who buy a property together in joint names, um, and where only one of them has previously owned a property, 
they cannot then reclaim. So that has um, the, the consequence that people who are, for example, not living together, um, but then get married and move into a joint property that they own jointly, are being penalised. And I'm assuming that is not the int that is not an intended consequence of 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 the government. You know, I'm attending that you know, the government's never set out to penalise people in that situation. So I wonder if, first of all, you recognise that is an issue, and secondly, you know, have you got any steps planned to try and deal with it? So in terms of um, evidence looking at those inconsistencies, uh, we look at a range of different things, including I look at my correspondence where these issues have been raised in the past. And, and like I say, a number of the, the issues that were raised at the roundtable and that get raised with me in, in correspondence, I am very sympathetic to. So if we start from that position, then how do we fix it? Now, the, the main difference between the amendment that was already taken through to change the unintended um, anomaly last time, and this one in particular, it, that one changed uh, cases where two people lived together um, already, but where only one of them was on the title um, and went on to buy a property together. However, in that scenario, it's possible to point to a single property and deem that both buyers have disposed of their previous main residence when this was sold. The reason I say that is that there's a test in the legislation which is about identifying a main residence that is then replaced. So that change was quite a minor change. And although there's similarities with the anomaly that you're talking about, it goes right to the heart of the purpose of this legislation, which is where you can identify a main residence that is then, that is then sort of a secondary residence to a new main residence. So in that particular example, I'm sympathetic to the individuals who find themselves caught up in it. But if we were to make changes, it would undermine the, the main purpose of the legislation, which is where somebody has an additional dwelling. So I understand that it means that if somebody... In any scenario, there's a whole range of different scenarios that you could look to to illustrate that, where two people, one person's renting, one person's um, owning, two people are owning. Either way, there's a previous residence and then they have another new residence. And therefore, it's a, an additional dwelling. So if we were going to make changes to the legislation, and I'd be open if the committee were to provide evidence of where they think this is a problem and how to resolve it i'd be open to considering it but it would be a far more significant change to the main test in the additional dwelling supplement legislation than the previous amendment that was made which may sound like a cop-out but it's just to make the point that you had revenue scotland before you as well i think and they talk about having over 70 worked examples in their guidelines to try and advise and support people when it comes to identifying um, whether or not they're eligible for, for ADS. Making changes makes it more complicated. Where we need to make changes, we should make changes, but I would want to know, first of all, how extensive the problem is before making changes, and secondly, be very careful that we're not taking away the main test in all of this, which opens it up to tax avoidance. <coughs> okay, thank you. I mean, that's a very helpful answer. And I do appreciate, just, just on, on, your, on, your, on the final point you make about the extent of the problem, I, 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 I recognise you know, there might be a very few isolated examples of what we're talking about, but for, I think you would appreciate it, for the individuals involved, you know, it may represent a very significant additional cost that they weren't anticipating. I mean, the, the, the previous example that, that, that I, I brought that led to the, uh, the, the 2016 Act, amongst, amongst, amongst other cases, but it was one couple I was aware of who ended up with an additional tax bill of £13,000, which, you know, for a young couple was a, a huge additional burden. And while I appreciate, you know, there might be a very small number of people impacted by this, for, for these individuals, this is a very substantial issue. And I think, I just ask you to reflect on that. But my question, I suppose, then is, um, we've, we've talked in the committee quite a bit about whether it would be appropriate to introduce an annual finance act as a means of sweeping up some of these issues on an annualised basis, instead of having to 
you know, rely on new primary legislation every year or, 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 or on a ad hoc basis to try and address these issues. And I wonder if you get any more thoughts about whether that would be a sensible way to take these issues forward. Yeah, and you'll know that our consultation on the future of devolved taxes closed just last week, so we're analysing responses to that. Um, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of mopping up changes on an annual basis, but I think that it needs to be taken forward closely with the Finance Committee and the Parliament, because obviously there's always a tension between scrutiny and efficiency with any of these changes. And if you look at the way in which the UK government has been able to improve and amend the, the, the higher rate additional dwelling um, element of SDLT, you, you can see a number of different changes that they've been able to make, which we've not made. We've made that one amendment, which although expedited, still had to go through three stages, still had a um, considerable number of amendments at stage two and stage three. And I would suggest that our legislative timetable does not allow for multiple amendments of that kind. And I think that, again, I'll look forward to your report, but I think there'd probably be consensus on where we could make changes to ADS to improve it. The question would be around process. And that, I think, I think ADS illustrates the need for a means to mop up changes that are required that are minor that everybody agrees on, which doesn't absorb unnecessary time. That's quite useful. I mean, whether we call that an annual tax bill or an annual care and maintenance bill, effectively the same thing. But I guess from a committee perspective and from a government perspective, uh, although, these, although these, some of these changes might be minor and considered by some to be necessary, the potential for unintended consequences would be something that I'm assuming the government would have to bear very much in mind if that bill was subject to significant amendment, for instance. Yes, and with all of this, I think, I go back to that point about weighing up scrutiny and deficiency with these changes. You would want the changes to be of the kind that are frequently raised with me and with yourselves by stakeholders that appear to be quite obvious and that improve the tax. And that's why I started off by talking about the introduction of ADS, which was, again, illustrates the point that where I might, I'm able to sit here and defend ADS, and I think it's a good idea. However, policy preferences aside, our hand was forced into doing something because of the UK government's introduction of the higher rate um, additional dwelling because of the impact on the market and the impact on BGA. And therefore, it was a very expedited process to introduce ADS in the first place. And again, that illustrates we are responding to external forces, and it would be far better to to do that well first time, but if you're required to move quickly to be able to make uh, it easier to amend and improve at a later date. Okay, Alex. Thank you, Camina. No, uh, members to my register of interest around construction. Um, I was really pick up on a point you mentioned about some of the data in, yeah, and you say that Revenue Scotland, uh, you know, can only present, you know, only discuss, or only uh, deliberate uh, the, the positive sales that happen that come through. Um, but really, this is more about uh, sales that don't happen, uh, and it impacts on other other aspects, LBTT, and other asp aspects of the sector. And yeah, and I appreciate it. So, yeah, it's, a, it's a very very complex to try and collect such data. Uh, but to say that because the, the revenue figure has remained constant, that means everything's all right. Is that not a false conclusion? You know, it really sort of misses out on what kind of potential uh, of a sector could be. And it was really just to get your view on. Uh, how we might go about collecting such better data or uh, a recognition that this is an issue of the sector uh, the sector faces and when you look at the, uh, the complexity of the sector and how data is coming into it and its impact on on our economy is this, mm. is this part of a, a wider problem well if i can answer the question on data and then the question on the the, the sector more generally so the when it comes to Revenue Scotland, which you may have explained, we rely on the data that they, they collect. And in the case of ADS, that's a one-page form. Um, and they um, ask for very limited information, which I can supply to the committee if they're of interest. It does not ask the questions that we might be more interested in, in terms of qualitative data around well, what the property is being used for. Is it being used for a holiday home? Is it used for a buy-to-let? Um, and we cannot 
demand necessarily through Revenue Scotland. It's Revenue Scotland's business to decide what information they ask. However, consistently, I have um, asked stakeholders um, for uh, evidence. So at the moment, a lot of the evidence, which is, and I don't say this to undermine it, but it's very anecdotal in nature. And that's fine because there are individuals who are in difficult circumstances. But if you're going to make a significant change that could have unintended consequences and open up issues around uh, tax avoidance, you want to know that it's an extensive problem and it's not just on the, on the periphery. So that kind of evidence from stakeholders themselves is of significant value. And to an extent, we do have to depend on that as much as we depend on the quantitative data from Revenue Scotland. In terms of the impact on the, the housing market more generally, um, which again, we look to, and I think, you know, I certainly can't claim any success in the housing market or first time buyers sort of proportion of the housing market is down to ADS and neither can we say that ADS is single-handedly responsible for, for any challenges and that comes through again in um, SFC data and also responses from um, stakeholder and again I think I said to the committee when we were in, in January taking forward the, the changes to LBTT that stakeholders regularly tell me that wider economic considerations are far more likely to be a factor in their decision making um, and if you look at the overall figures, as I said, private rented sector is just one example, that it remains a, a steady 15%. Um, when it comes to the SME market, which I am interested in how we better to support the SME house building market, I think, again, there are probably better ways of supporting that market than necessarily through ADS, although that's a consideration. So, for example, at the moment we have um, different conditions for SME applicants um, for housing support when it comes to the Building Scotland Fund. So there's a, a lower threshold for project size in terms of, of getting support. I think that's probably a, a better, more flexible way of ensuring a thriving SME house building market than, than necessarily tweaking ADS. Thank you, Ash. Willie. Just to ask you, <coughs> is there a case to perhaps simplify the information that's available to the public on this so that they don't feel they have to walk in the door of a lawyer's office in order to discover the consequences of what they're about to do in parts of the house, for example? Surely that we could offer some kind of simplification or helpful advice to, to assist them in their decision making before they embark on these transactions? Yeah, I, I, and, and that goes to the heart of this entire debate of how we ensure that it's nuanced sufficiently for specific individual circumstances whilst at the same time reducing the complexity. And it is a complex task because tax because it takes into account personal circumstances rather just than just transactional values, etc. Uh, and I know that Revenue Scotland try hard when it comes to, to worked examples, but with over 70 worked examples, it is incredibly complicated. Some of the figures, if, if you look at the figures for um, a sort of indication to reclaim ADS, that those are more heartening. So it, you can obviously register your, um, in, you know, your inclination to reclaim ADS. Um, and there is advice at that point, particularly through Revenue Scotland, if you're going to reclaim. But if there is ways to simplify it, I would be delighted to hear how we simplify it. Okay. okay, nobody else has indicated they want to take part in this, Minister. So I can thank you very much for coming along and giving us evidence this morning. I know this public part of the meeting. <laughs>